Welcome to the Origin Canine Podcast, where we speak to authentic and inspiring voices from the working canine world. Listen to this episode, subscribe to the podcast, follow us on social media, and go to origincanine.com. Enjoy the show. Okay, Dave, welcome to another episode of the Origin Canine Podcast, guys. Um, so today we've got John Devine, uh, Devine Canines, another American guest. Um, and John, you're actually the first Trident wearing Navy SEAL that I've had on the show. I've had two direct support guys, but you're the first like Navy SEAL go through buds that I've had on the show, man. So right, thanks, man. Representing. No pressure. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for having me on. And uh, I hope I, I leave an okay impression being the first one. Mate, I, I reckon you will, man, because um, for context for people watching this, you and I met at SHOT Show uh 2023 wasn't it beginning of last year um we got introduced by tony blower um and <clears throat> mate if you're a friend of tony you're a friend of my man tony made a, a really good impression on me dude that was the first time i met him too and mm-hmm. he came on the podcast and man you must be an all right dude man so i think you'll be fine yeah yeah tony's <laughs> a cool dude i mean he's really um one of the real like originators of getting combatives uh into the into mainstream really where combatives before him was very much a very very niche thing that like not a lot of people did it was all martial arts before that everything was martial arts martial arts which hey nothing wrong with martial arts but um when you're trying to train a guy as um as good as you can in the shortest amount of time for war there's a time and a place for it and spending like you know 15 20 years to make him a black belt in the martial art might not be a the road when you need to just make him as deadly as he possibly can be in the shortest amount of time. And that's really what like he focused on. And he brought a lot to the table with law enforcement, military and, uh, and, and the everyday warrior. Yeah. And it was funny, man. Cause I, um, I've done a bunch of Tony stuff in the unit and didn't, I, I just didn't realize what it was, where it came from. Cause it was a slightly mm-hmm. bastardized version. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I, I met Tony and it was, I think it was on the podcast. He was talking about it. And I was like, bro, I've done your stuff. Like I, I recognize the sort of stuff that he does. I was like, that's really cool. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I think that a lot of people have taken what he's done and kind of continued carrying that torch. Like they continue to, modify their style of it and things like that. Another really, really good buddy of mine, Dom Razo, you know, he's uh, at Dynamis Alliance. He does a lot with combatives and uh, he had a lot of his uh, original training was, was through Tony. You know, he went on to like, you know, learn other stuff, but Tony was a big influence on what he's doing as well. Yeah. Yeah. I, I saw that um, recently. I saw the, the episode with, with Dom on the Sean Ryan show. And he, he this, again, that was another reminder to like, get you on. He dropped your name early in that. He said you guys grew up together and whatnot and went to like go do the seal thing together. So yeah. That's cool, man. It's it's such a small world, you know what I mean? Like yeah. yeah. You know, Sean Ryan. Not that my podcast, mine's like a backwater podcast, like a like a cheap version of the Sean Ryan show. Sean Ryan from wish.com. But um yeah, it's funny how small this world is, eh? Yeah. But I think that also like the conversations you're having are um are very like niche and that, you know, you're very much focused in the, in the dog world. And so can't compare yourself to what Sean Ryan's doing in, in that he's just talking to anyone in the world that has interesting stories, which is also a cool thing too. But I, I think that one, anyone that's involved in canines, involved in dog training uh, or interested in dog training in the dog world, they're going to get more value out of a podcast like yours than they would Sean Ryan, you know? So as, as good as I, you know, Sean, if you're watching, do love your podcast. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> But um, but it's not like a super dog podcast. It's just a everyday awesomeness, awesomeness uh podcast. <laughs> yeah, and you're right. Sean probably is watching actually because he's probably yeah, he, going, man. Yeah, I wish he, I'd done a. He better be. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> he's like, fuck! I should have done a dog podcast. Damn it. Yeah. Um, hey, bro. So I want to like you. Obviously, you read the, the questions at the beginning of the podcast. Um, mate, I want to rip into your childhood okay. to start, just to sort of like know what your your formative sure. years were like, and then. Um, obviously influences to get you in the SEAL teams and then later on into the into the dog world, man. So if you don't mind taking us through that, please. Sure, sure, sure. So as a kid, I grew up in, in New England. So I, I spent time in New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, uh, in, the north, in the Northeast. Uh, did a small stint in Florida for a little while, but most of my real formative years was, was in New England. So go Patriots, you know, Red Sox. Uh, 
don't know what that means. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, it's see, this is all you know, American sports, baseball, football, the two most like American things possible, you know. But uh um, yeah. <laughs> but uh, you know, grew up in in the northeast there, and I knew that I wanted to be a Navy SEAL at a very at a very young age. So it was maybe I could be probably eight years old when I wanted to be a Navy SEAL. I think I saw Navy SEALs with Charlie Sheen in it. And I was like, wow, that is, that is super cool. Charlie Sheen, you know, super cool. So that started the kind of the journey, but it was all these books that I was reading. So I, I would go to the library and I'd read all these books. And, you know, my buddy Dom and I, we were living right across the street from each other. So we both grew up like reading these books and wanting to be Navy SEALs. And we kept doing things that we thought would be preparing us to be Navy SEALs. So like, you know, you can imagine what a eight-year-old, nine-year-old, you know, as we keep going, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, it's like, you know, we're, we're, um, you know, buying military fatigues, you know, we're playing manhunt. Uh, we get involved in doing paintball, uh, you know, all these things that uh, we get, we get certified in scuba diving. I think we were like 12 when we both got certified in scuba diving um, together. So we did the whole course oh, yeah. together. Um, and it's super funny because here we are, you know, 12 and Dom was a little bit older than me, but uh, we were, you know, preteens and teens doing scuba diving training. And both of us were not exactly like the, the A plus student that you would, <laughs> we weren't A plus students. So we'll leave it at that. But like when we were in the, the dive course, I think we like tested higher than everyone in the class because we were just super focused on um on wanting to do it if it was something we were interested in it was we were we would do really 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 well and uh i think that's kind of been a theme throughout my whole life is that if it's anything i'm ever interested in i don't have a um a governor on it it's like i'm all in or or not at all you know is, is basically it so you know growing up we uh you know the the bar was raised as we got older. So then we're in the, like, when we're teenagers, we're at the pool, the YMCA and like the, uh, the Marina private pool club and stuff. And we're tying each other up, throwing each other in the water, you know, and, uh, <laughs> sometimes with the permission of the lifeguard and sometimes without the permission of the lifeguard, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and all this was really because we both really had that goal of wanting to be, wanting to be a seal and, you know, into, graduation like high school age uh dom ended up going in pretty young where i ended up going to school first and so i did a few years at college and then i ended up ended up going in the military after that so dom was kind of had a little bit of a head start and you know the war on terror at that point was already on and going and i kind of feel like i might have not been mature enough like mentally i think i think honestly going to school for me was like a almost like a stalling, not feeling like I was ready enough yet kind of mode in my life. And, uh, you know, then I basically bit the bullet and joined and, and went in, uh, went through, you know, boot camp, all that stuff. Ended up going to Bud's and I got injured pretty badly in that like both my legs were uh, stress fractures and, and badly. And I didn't end up getting through my first try at Bud's. So it did take me two tries. So yeah. I went through like a bit of a... Um, a hiatus and like a purgatory, I kind of call it. And then I ended up getting stationed in Lemoore, California. And, uh, you know, there at my command, you know, it's everyone that everyone there sees buds, they call them bud, buds duds, you know, and they, they there's a plenty, there's a, <laughs> there's plenty of buds duds that are there. And I, and you guys might not realize this, but with a graduation rate rate of less than 30%, uh, there's a lot of buds duds in the Navy. And so for the rest of the Navy, it's just a big joke to them, all these buds duds. And, uh, but like when I, when I left there, I knew it, like, I didn't leave feeling super defeated. I left being like, I know I can do this. I just need to fix one thing. And that was like my running mileage and the, the being able to like keep going without breaking down. And I knew that if I could fix that, that I would make it through the program because everything else, I felt like I was on top of everything. And I was like, that's this one thing. So I ended up um, being stationed Lamore, and I went back to the drawing board of like, okay, what's going on with my mileage, my running? I have to be able to run a lot of miles without breaking down. How do I do this? And I had to turn into like a mad scientist about it because for whatever reason, the way my biometrics work, I was not meant for heel-toe running. I was not meant for traditional running. So anytime my mileage started going over 25 miles a week, I would start getting stress fractures and I'd start getting injuries. And I was working on this for months and months and I just couldn't do it. So 
I was so frustrated and, and, and almost like getting ready to feel defeated almost because I was like, how am I ever going to go back to buds and be a seal? if I can't run more than 25 miles a week. This is, this is insane. I can't, you know, why can't I do this? I was very frustrated. So I, uh, went back to the drawing board, did research. I'm on these online running forums and I found this thing called pose running and pose running is basically running on your four feet. So instead of running heel toe traditional style, I ran four feet, kind of like how people run with bare barefoot. So I transitioned to that and slowly but surely I rebuilt my mileage to actually be able to like run like marathon training mileage, you know, and be able to start hitting like, you know, 35, 40, 45, 50 miles a week and was really able to establish a really good baseline. And then my whole training uh, method kind of changed in that I knew I was fast enough. I knew I could swim. And so I still did all those things in my training, but the primary focus of my training was to make sure that I could put the mileage and that pounding on and not break down. And that was my, that was my focus. And I, and I did that and then going into buds kind of funny, but I went from like breaking down from running to becoming one of the strongest runners in the class in that there was guys wholeheartedly were way faster than me. Like some of the guys were like runners in college, they were triathletes, they were, they were good. But I trained so much in soft sand that when we were doing those conditioning runs, I was one of maybe like a couple guys in the class to never actually get gooned on another run. So like every run in first phase in Buds, I didn't get gooned on a single one my second time, which, you know, going back to the first time at Buds was I got gooned on every single run. <laughs> so Take us through the, the goon. Sorry. What, what, what does that so, mean? So getting gooned basically means that if you fall behind on a run, uh, which is almost the majority of the class, really. It's the majority of the class does get gooned. They usually make different layers of it. So if you're in a conditioning run, getting gooned means extra attention after the conditioning run. So nice. the mindset that I definitely saw in the class was guys were almost anticipating getting gooned. They almost kind of like were like, I'm getting gooned anyway. I may as well just like try to conserve my energy and uh, just get gooned. But um, I was able to kind of break into this other mode of like, no, 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 no. Like this is life or death. I'm staying at the front of the pack no matter what. Because I know that if I put out now, it's worth it because then I get a rest. So I put out now. I don't care if I feel like I'm going to die. I stay with the instructor. I stay at the top. I stay at the front. And if they ever do any kind of trickery, which they do sometimes, well, they'll have the entire class stop, do a 180, and then turn and run the other way, which now if you were in the front, you're now in the back. So <laughs> nice. then I'd be like, so then I'm like, all right, I get to the front. I get to the front because if anyone knows anything about running in like large groups like that, if you're in the back and you start falling behind, it only gets worse and worse because the guy in front of you gets falling back. The guy in front of him falls back. So before you know it, you're like a quarter mile behind the instructor, you know? So you want to just get to the front, stay at the front, stay with the instructor. And that's the way you survive a condition and run. So if anyone is looking for one of the secrets to making it through buds, you <laughs> get to the front, you stay at the front. Yeah. Basically, we're right. Yep. Exactly it. And this is where they really install that on you. They install that it pays to be a winner. And it did. Like if, if I put out and I made it through that conditioning run, it was worth it. It was worth it because when the rest of the class is getting beaten down, you're like sipping a canteen and kind of resting. Yeah. I hey, do. There's, there's a bunch of stuff I want to, I want to draw out of that. There's a huge theme in this, right? Obviously in the States, you guys have that really well-worn path, you know, high school, college, go get a corporate job, et cetera. And it sounds like you've you've had this real, this affinity for going to be a Navy SEAL. You said you, yourself and Dom, you know, weren't super academic kind of guys, but you were like crushing it when you came to the, you know, the, the dive course and then obviously getting into the SEALs and whatnot. Um, and I think that speaks volumes, man, about hard work versus, versus talent, so to, think, uh, so to speak. Um, especially when you sort of moved on to talking about, you know, Post injury and recovery, and then obsessing over like the solution to this problem, man, um, bro. That means so much more to me than like, you know, being the naturally gifted runner, the guy with the high IQ that went to college and that did X, Y, Z. Like, I much, I much prefer that. Mm. If that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, because like I think that if you're just naturally talented, and and trust me, there are some guys I even know in my class that they they were natural natural athletes. They were great and. Uh, but it's like, what did you learn from that? Um, I mean, I'm obviously they learned something going through buds, but uh, it's almost like the the underdog story. You know, when you when people are watching a movie, you know, watch the guy who just naturally crushes everything is, you know, 
kind of boring. But when you watch Rocky, you watch this guy who's like this underdog who's like drinking eggs out of a out of a glass <laughs> in a beaten down, run down apartment, and he's like, you know, the underdog. You know, wasn't meant to win that fight, but he did. You know, uh, that's kind of like how that's that's a little bit how I felt. But uh, you know, the attitude is is that I think that you only are defeated when you actually quit. When you actually resolve to defeat is when you're defeated. But um, even though I didn't make it through my first time, I didn't feel like I was completely defeated. The feeling I had was like it was like of a team that made it to the Super Bowl and didn't win. That's kind of like how I felt. I kind of felt like I was like, all right. I made it to the I made it to where I need to be. I didn't win. Why? And I was like, it's very simple for me. I broke down. So I just knew I was like, everything else I'm doing in this class, I was I was fine with. The only thing I wasn't fine with was this one thing. And so for me, it was a, it was a little easier. Um, some of the statistics that I did find out was that guys that don't make it through the, the first time at Buds that go back for a second time, the odds of them making it through is even lower. It's it's something in like the single digit numbers. And this is like stuff, I, maybe it's good I didn't know that, but like I found that out afterwards that uh, guys that are going back for a second time have a much, much lower chance of making it through, which kind of makes sense in a way because if they didn't make it through, there was probably an issue of why they didn't make it through. So what was the issue? Did it get fixed? Uh, I think mentally, and this is just going back uh, and knowing the guys that were in my class that were second timers that were going through that, that ended up quitting and things like that. I remember kind of analyzing it. And I think what happens is the, the farther re we are removed from pain, the more we forget about how painful it was. And so for me, when I was training, no matter what I did, everything I did, and I did a lot of training uh, before I left. I mean, my, my training was like two to three sessions a day, usually every day was like my, my normal day uh, training leading up to that. But after every workout, no matter no matter how much I put out, no matter how much I was I was hurting, I'd be like, it only gets worse. This is only going to be more painful, so get ready for it. Not like I think the reverse attitude people have is like, oh, I'm training so hard, it's never going to be as hard as this. It's like, no, no, no. I think the opposite. It's like I trained really hard today and I put out a lot, but it's going to get worse. So don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We we had one of the instructors on my selection course. He used to have two sayings. And, uh, and we'd always laugh about it. One of the sayings was, it's going to end. Like the pain, the suffering, it's going to end. And his other saying was, there's always more. <laughs> yep. So we'd always be like, it's going to end, but there's always yep. more. But that yep. will end, but then there'll be more. Yeah. So it, it's true, man. And I think that's probably a better mentality than like, oh, man, I'm going to go into this thing and I, I know I've trained really hard and I'm going to fucking kill it because of because I'm super fit. Like, yeah. They can, they can do anything to you to make you hurt. Well, I'm going to do three hours of burpees. Well, fuck, I didn't train three hours of burpees. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And the, yep. the other question, mate, was um, going, going back to – sorry, I just want to put a few things into context here in, in terms of timeline. Um, September 11, how old were you and, and where were you when that was happening? I was in high school. Yeah. Yep. Yep. You know, you know, so like uh, it was a, ve a very real thing. So it definitely went from, oh, I'm joining the SEAL teams uh, to be a SEAL turned into like, I'm joining the SEAL teams to go to war. So, you know, it was a very, very real thing that my generation, uh, everything changed, you know? So, I mean, a lot of guys, uh, the guys before me were joining the military to join the military. Everyone from my generation forward was joining the military to go to war. And so it was a very real thing. Yeah. And what year did you have your first crack at Buds? Uh, 2005. Yep. Fuck, so really early in, in, yep. in that, in, in the G1. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Uh, so, I mean, all your instructors that are training you at that point were all guys. I, I think that every single one of my Buds instructors had – combat experience they had you know bronze stars silver stars these guys were decorated like war heroes and it really changes a lot because i mean really you you respected them already because they they are they are what you want to be and then you have these guys that have already been to war some of these guys have already been shot some of these guys are have their you know some some of these guys are missing legs and things like that uh and they are they're heroes to you with like when you're a student you know they really are i mean they're heroes they're still heroes to me now you know even though i you know joined their ranks and you know did 
did what they did. Um, well, not not what everyone, <laughs> some of those guys did a lot more than what I did, but uh, they really are what you what you aspire to be. So there's like this level of um, of respect and that you, it's it's so much different than, I'll just say boot camp, for instance, because you have these RDCs in boot camp, these like instructors that, yeah, like you have to, you have to do, you have to humble yourself and be humble, but they're not doing what you want to do, you know? So you don't, you're not aspiring to be them. You're aspiring. Once you get to buds, it's much, much, much harder. But for me, it was actually easier in that one regard because these guys that are telling me to do the, these, these things, they did this already and I want to be them. Yeah, that, that, it's got to be more motivating. It's almost like a boot camp. You, you, one of your instructors could be like a cook or something, and you're like, yes. I've got to get past you, but I'm not aiming to be you. Yeah. that That's exactly, exactly it. Yeah. And and, and I know, um, like, it, it was the same in our unit, right? No one's ever sitting around talking about selection. Mm -hmm. um, and it's the same with seals. No one's sitting around talking about butts. It's just, it's the first course you do. There's about 50 courses after, then there's a career deployments, et cetera, et cetera. Yep. Yep. But for the sake of my audience, could you no please <laughs> yes. no, take sure. us through buds, man? <laughs> okay. So I'll break down buds like uh, from a, a wide angle lens here in that. So buds itself, just buds is about six months long. Each phase is broken up into about two months each, you know, give or take. Different, um, and then after buds, there is SQT, and SQT is the follow-on training. It's called SEAL qualification training because when you finish that, you get your Trident and you show up at your team as a basic SEAL. So, like in theory, if you had to, you could get put in a platoon and you would know the basics of what it is to be a SEAL. Now, when you show up to a team, it's obviously you're the brand new guy. You don't know shit. And it's true. But the one thing I will say is that the program has evolved to at least fundamentally train guys to that if they had to get thrown onto a deployment as a brand new guy, they could be they, they could do something, you know, where pre 9-11, like pre that generation, it was buds. And then you show up to your SEAL team not knowing shit. And then like your your SEAL team itself had to train you to be a SEAL. And so they did. And they did. They, they absolutely did. Like they took these guys in, they trained them, they, they put them through training and uh but it was all like internal where now it's, it's that you don't show up to a SEAL team unless you're at least a basic trained SEAL. Yeah. So when do you get the Trident? So you get the Trident after SQT. So the buds for six months, SQT for six months, and then you get your Trident and then you show up to your team. Yeah. So, so the whole and process I is about just over a year. If you don't get hurt, if you don't get rolled, um, it's just over a year about. Well, unless you unless you include boot camp and getting into the military, but if the the day you show up to buds, if you cruise through it, no injuries, no rolls, it's about a year. Yeah, that's a huge investment, hey. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'll give I you. I think mine. Okay. I'll give you like a for instance is like, I went a year of buds SQT, then I show up to my SEAL team, and then I spent another year and a half training at my SEAL team before I ever deployed. So in all honesty, I was training for two and a half years for war before I ever was put in a position to have to fire a shot. You know, so two, yeah. Yeah, two and a half years, yeah, two and a half years, two and a half years of training to be a SEAL <laughs> before I ever was in a position to fire a shot. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you got to have some focus, man, because I've, you know, it's like there's a lot of Navy SEAL media out there and I've, I've spoken to a few guys about this kind of stuff. They were the direct, direct support guys. Um, and I've, you know, read the books and movies and whatever. And it's, man, it's a long pipeline, bro. I mean, to stay focused for that long and then, like, I, I think about it now post-military and it, to me it seems exhausting. <laughs> yeah. But at the, at the time, you're so focused and you don't care. You're just happy to fucking punch through any and all obstacles. Yeah. Yeah. And so what about um so SQT is that is that when you go like to the island and you do that sort of like um those team tactics movement sort of stuff or so that at the island at San Clemente Island, that is third phase of buds. So at buds you, okay. you get like a so at, in third phase it's called land warfare phase. And that's like the basic that, that's the first time you really have a gun in your hand and you're and you're being taught how to shoot, move, and communicate and how to use demolitions. 
So you you do learn basic squad tactics at a basic level, but that's really just to prepare you for when you go to SQT and you actually are doing live fire shooting training exercises and things like that. So like the the bar gets raised at SQT and it's really I think it's a crawl walk run mentality in that it was generally pretty safe at all times. I'm not saying it wasn't it wasn't hard. It was hard. But you know, when you're in I'll give you for instance, but at at uh at Buds, you're running around with like, you know, a stock M4 with like iron sights and you're using flares and things like that, very old school stuff. Uh, communicating within your within your one squad of two fire teams, learning how to maneuver with two fire teams, you know, and then before you know it, fast forward to SQT, and now you're on radios, you're on comms, you have night vision, you have lasers, you have optics, you're communicating with other squads, uh, you're taking direct, you're taking uh, react to contact, doing IADs, uh, you know, blending in all the individual movement techniques that you've been taught to mit to mitigate being shot. Uh, being able to communicate with your battle buddies next to you within your fire team and, you know, bounding over watches and center peels and uh, all these different maneuvers that you you learn um, just gets brought up. So uh, it gets pretty intricate, but I never felt like it was overwhelming because it was very much a crawl, walk, run mentality. Yeah. And excuse me for all the, the, uh, the buds and, SQT question. Oh, no you're just oh, no you're just the guy that's going to have to explain it <laughs> for everyone else because you're the first guy that's gone through it for me. <clears throat> and what about getting you tried it and then going to the teams? What's the reception like as the as the new guy? Uh, sorry, and what team as well? Okay, so I went to SEAL Team Five, and when you, when you show up, you know you have a platoon. We had about four, four or five new guys in my first platoon. And, and that's of a platoon that's, you know, between 16 to 18 guys, you know, maybe, um, and that, and that's like a standard size for a SEAL platoon around that, uh, it can vary now. Now, generally speaking, when you deploy a SEAL platoon, it would probably be a little bit bigger because you generally will get assets added on to that, whether it be in, Intel guys, EOD guys, things like that. So that number does, does probably go up during deployment, but that's like a standard size for a SEAL platoon. And you basically lean on the guys in your platoon that have been, that have gone through it already. You know, you have guys that have had multiple deployments. Um, they, it really is like an apprenticeship type type of job where just because you show up to your team, uh, you still have a lot to learn. You still have a lot to learn because you went through all that in SQT, but now you do that, all that same stuff. And that bar gets raised again. So now it's like, all right, you went through buds, basic stuff, flares, iron sights, basic shooting and moving to SQT with doing IADs, react to contacts, all these things. And it's now you start doing it within your, your team and platoon SOPs and things like that. So now it's like, all right, you're working alongside, you're, you're having your belt fed machine guns singing with each other while your JTAC is calling on CAS, while your snipers are taking guys out, while they're calling out targets, while, you know, while you're calling in, in, you know, artillery and all sorts of stuff. And then it gets really put into more mission applicable scenarios, a lot more scenario based training where they're looking at what's going on overseas and they're implementing it directly in the training. Um, and unless you train under, under Jocko at the time, which was just make it as shitty as possible and everything else will be <laughs> easy. <laughs> We're going to get on the Jocko in a minute. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. At the time Jocko was the, um, he was the OIC of trade at, and what that meant was that every platoon before they basically deployed would have to go through his training. And he made sure that it was hard personally. Yeah. <laughs> I really, I actually want to ask about Jocko because he's an interesting character to me. Mm -hmm. Was that, was he back then? What year is this? Sorry, by, by the way, what year is this? Did you get to the team? Okay. So this is around 2007 um, to 2010 around, you know, around there. But like that was like the period that I was, you know, there at that team. Okay. And and back then was was Jocko still like good? Good. <laughs> so, <laughs> was so, I'll be on, so I'll be honest, like Jocko was very much um very similar to he I don't really think he's he's not really playing that much of a character. He's just I think his character that he plays now is just exaggerating who he is. That's all it is. It, it it's not made up. This is exactly who he is. It's just more. Uh, it's just like more of who he is. 
you know? Yeah. That's all it is. He's always been a really intense dude. Uh, very much, uh, in my opinion, was willing to put the guys through what he'd be willing to put himself through. Uh, but he did. He personally took personal accountability on making training as hard as he possibly could. And, you know, in, in his opinion, I think that the harder you bleed in training, the less you bleed in war. So we, uh, we did some bleeding in training. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah and if uh, i'm not overly familiar with jocko's career and in his trajectory and the timeline but if he was there 2007 to 10 roughly <clears throat> um that would have been post ramadi for him too because i think ramadi was like 2005 six correct yep yeah that was that was actually okay. post ramadi for him yep yeah, gotcha. So he's already had all those experiences in combat. He's already formulated his idea about what you should be doing and then applying Correct. it to you guys. Interesting, man. Yep. Yeah. And uh, again, a, a, another ignorant question, mostly for the audience. So you've got your SEAL teams, you've got your odds and your evens on, on you know, Western East Coast, and then you've got your, in layman's terms, your SEAL Team 6, which is your mm -hmm. development group. Can you just mm -hmm. give us the sort of rundown between like the in in quotes regular SEAL teams versus like the dev group guys. Got it, got it. So the way I kind of break it down is that development group is kind of like the all-star SEAL team in that they only draw from the SEAL teams. So if you want to go to Damn Neck, you have to screen, be select you have to screen for selection, make it through the selection process, then go to green team. And green team itself is like a six month process of of going through this training pipeline that is is pretty competitive meaning that if you mess up you, you get kicked and and then absolutely there's guys like dom that can definitely give you a much 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 better depiction of it because he went through it but again it's like you're doing all the things that seals do but then the bar gets raised to another level because i'll give you a for instance but for instance like we're all halo qualled we're all you know jump trained you know we're we're we all all seals have that actually all seals are free fall parachutists we can jump into a target stuff like that but then you go to damn neck and now it's like you are going to be jumping on night vision uh stacking up and guiding on gps to land at a specific spot under canopy you know so the the bar gets raised so it's just it's another bar that just gets raised and then you know they are the guys that get called for like things like the osama bin bin laden mission so, you know, when, when things are going down, they're the first ones to get picked. Yeah. And what's that like as a, as a SEAL, you know, in your mind, you're like, I've reached the pinnacle. I'm a Navy SEAL. Like we're on the, on the, the top of the food chain in the, you know, the special operations world. And then you're like, oh, fuck, there's more. You're like, yeah. so I'm going to do this, this Navy SEAL stuff. And I'm going to do it even more and better to be in the next group. Is that like, so, is that, was that off putting for you or is that like, a, fuck, I want to do that? No, I mean, honestly, for me at the time, I was interested in going to Damn Neck. It was definitely something that I thought as like the next step. Um, it's just that I think my last deployment, I'm not going to say my last deployment changed everything for me, but my last deployment, I saw the writing on the, on the wall with Afghanistan. And I saw that like the things that we were doing was very frustrating. I left that deployment very frustrated and kind of like disenfranchised a little bit with what we were doing. And when I got back, uh, you know, other things ended up happening where I ended up um, not being able to continue deploying with my dog. And at that point it was like, all right, so now I'm not deploying with my dog. I'm having the option of like going to Guam, becoming an instructor or doing some kind of admin position and just none of it interested me. You know, so I was and I was in the position where I was like, none of this is appealing to me and none of this is why I joined. And I got to a point where it was like I wasn't willing to invest another enlistment for the chance that after this enlistment, I'll get to do something that I want to do. It was almost because you're also at that point when when you get post 10 years in the military, if you reenlist again, it's pretty much like the way it's kind of structured is you do another enlistment and now you're now you're at 14 or 15 years and then you're at 14 or 15 years and pretty much everybody does the additional years to hit 20 to get their retirement 
And so the way I looked at it was like, if I reenlist, that means I'm probably going to be reenlisting for, for 10 more years to make it a full 20. And I don't think I'm willing to invest an extra 10 years in this to do something that I don't want to do that I didn't join to do. Like I joined to go to war. I joined to save lives. I joined to be part of like the most elite fighting unit in the world. Um, I joined to make a difference. Uh, but I just felt like me staying another 10 years, I didn't see that as a guaranteed possibility. And so I, I, that, that's where I basically made the decision to get out. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can totally see that, man. Yeah. Cause I mean, I won't bully with, with my stuff, but I, I mean, I did Afghanistan and then I did Iraq and the, and like they were, for me, they were both a bit frustrating, but it was kind of the same for me. I was just like, I don't know, man, this is just, there just seems to be less and less of this stuff. You know, they were like, the, I don't think people realize how unique the global war on terror was 2001 yeah. to what, what's the end of the global war on terror, like 2020 or something. Yeah. Like, I don't think people realize yeah. how unique that period of warfare was, especially some of those, Atlanta, I only, I only know this from the podcast, some of those like early Iraq deployments, mm -hmm. you know, with like the dev guys or, or the CAG guys and, um, yeah, to go from that to then nothing would be like, you know, like, oh, okay, well, that that's the bar that I've had in my mind is we go to yeah. war, we go to war, we go to war, we go to war. So yep. then like, oh, you want to go to Guam? You're like, no. No, I do not want to go to Guam. <laughs> you to be an instructor? Yeah. No. <laughs> Send me some pictures of uh, of some chafe balls, please. <laughs> some dog balls, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> I'm keeping that in, no, jokes. No, no, um, I... I it, it, this is a this is a you know a day in life You're right here chief dog boss. yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> um oh fuck man fuck what we fucking talk a bit <laughs> i know huh it, the chief chief dog balls just kind of throws it off no worries um uh, yeah just uh we were just talking about how like you know the 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 period of time um uh, getting just getting out of the military now um i know it might be fast forwarding through some things that we might want to go over but um but I'll say that that period of time, at least for me, was like I loved the mission. I loved what I was doing. I loved being able to deploy with with the boys and felt like I was part of something. And I loved it even more when I was working with a dog. I felt like I was saving lives, you know, and I felt like I was making a difference. But the moment that you feel like you're not making a difference anymore, it's easy to get frustrated with what you're doing. And so when I was in Afghanistan, the, uh, the thing I took away from it was that as much as I didn't feel like we we're making a big impact on Afghanistan itself, that wasn't my mission. My mission was not to save Afghanistan. My mission was to make sure that the boys next to me, the guy next to me came home. And that was my mission. So it was like my mission to make sure that we weren't running into IEDs, that there weren't unknown threats, uh, that I was just making the biggest difference I could, I could make so that everyone comes home. Yeah. And I, and I want to cover that. I, I, will, I want to go over some of the, the deployment SEAL team stuff as well, but I definitely want to talk about that, man, because that's – I think that's a huge part. Um, and you're obviously kind of doing it um, in, you know, post-military. You, you're really involved in that sort of veteran space, particularly with the dogs, and you've probably got a, a more of a, an interesting perspective, I reckon. But it's it seems that's one of those things where it's like if you don't feel like you're making a difference, <clears throat> if you've lost that higher purpose, that higher calling – the military's no longer scratching that itch. That that can be a huge catalyst for, you know, mental health issues, and then you know even extreme things like suicide. Like I don't feel like I'm making a difference anymore. I don't feel like what I'm doing matters. I that's hitting the nail on the head right there. I think one of the biggest issues when veterans, uh, and this is you know all branches, all different militaries across the world, really. When guys are in, they feel like they have a mission. They feel like they have a purpose. And when they get out, a lot of times they feel like they don't have a purpose. And when people don't have a purpose, they really struggle. They can, re they can really, really struggle. And it's also why I can see people that are in really dire, shitty situations, but when they feel like they have a purpose, they're able to keep pushing through. They feel like there's still a purpose for them to be here. You know? And I'll, and I'll give you, a, I mean, one short insight like when i was in buds for instance when i was going to buds so obviously i went through the first time the second time i went through i actually was a freshly frocked e5 meaning that i just made e5 showing up there and i hadn't even been getting paid for it yet i was a brand new e5 
And so there were plenty of guys there that were higher ranks than me that I never thought I'd be the LPO of the class. But come hell week, they started dropping like flies. And by Tuesday morning, I think it was like one or two o'clock in the morning, I became the LPO of the class. And it was something I didn't even really anticipate happening because it was like, I'm just one of the dudes here, you know, but something did change that like what it was that moment that I heard my name yelled divine. And I'm, I'm like getting surf tortured with the rest of the class. I'm like, why are they call my name? I'm like, I'm probably just gonna beat me or something. And, you know, whatever, you know, cool. I'll get up there. Like, and then I get up there and they're like, you're the LPO now. And I was like, Oh, okay. And that's pretty much the ceremony of, of me becoming the LPO. And that was it. Uh, when I went back, uh, I talked to one of the instructors and he told me the story of like what happened, but like one of the prior guys quit. And then, so they turned to the next guy who was the next in line to be LPO. He's like, you're the LPO now. And then he's like, no, I'm not. And they're like, yes, you are. You're the LPO <laughs> now. He's like, no, I'm not. And he's like, no, you're the LPO. And he's like, no, I'm not. I quit. And so, so then like that guy quit. And that's how I became the LPO apparently. Fucking default, default. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and like, yeah. So what's, what's the LPO? Sorry. So being the LPO, it's like, you're the senior enlisted guy in the class. So you basically, you're now put in a place of responsibility and that you're being held accountable for the class's actions and what's going on with the class. Now there still is an OIC. There's a, there's an officer that, be, that is in charge, but as the LPO, you're supposed to be like, because there's more enlisted guys than there are officers. You know, the officers we had in the class were like single digit numbers. Um, there's obviously a lot more enlisted guys. But as like the the senior enlisted guy in the class, you're supposed to be a leading beacon for that class and and take accountability and responsibility for what's happening. And one thing that happened is that that point forth, um, instead of worrying about my own misery, I was too busy dealing with what the class was doing to even worry about what my own misery was. So I wasn't really concerned with like how chafed I was, how tired I was, how beat down I was. It was more like, do we have all our guys? Do we have a full head count? Like I was too busy, like worrying about guys. Guys are telling me they're going to quit. I'm trying to tell them not to. And, um, you know, I, I was just too consumed with what was happening in the class to even worry about myself. Yeah. And and I think that that's a good, like you've conveyed that message well, man. I think if you've got a purpose and you've got, you've got things to do, you don't necessarily have time to worry about the pain or how cold it is or the sand or, or all those little, little tiny little one percenters that would normally make you go, ah, fuck, this is shit. I quit. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. 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 So, so I, was, I yeah, sometimes I'll, tell, I'll, I'll tell people when they get out of the military, one of the biggest things they should, like they can do if they're struggling. And this is what I found when I got out, you know, I think everyone struggles to a degree and I was absolutely no exception. I struggled with when I got out. And the first thing I did was like, just try to help someone. And I tried to help somebody else and that helped me because I felt like I was helping. I felt like I was making a difference. And I feel like that is what helped me transition from being, you know, part of the world's best fighting force, having a purpose, having a job, knowing a mission, knowing what you're doing to being a civilian was that I just found someone to help. And I started, I started there. I started helping. Yeah, and then that's such an interesting that's that's it's actually quite profound. As simple as it sounds to say, it is a profound thing. Like I've I've I don't think I've ever articulated it that way, but the most the best I've felt is when I'm helping someone or if I'm having a positive influence on someone. And that's kind of what I try and do with this business, you know what I mean? And yep. sometimes I lose sight of that. But I I think that's the essence of what I'm trying to do at the moment is trying to help people and influence them in, in a positive way. Um, and hold that thought because I really I want to get back to that one kind of closer to the end because that's more tied into what you're doing now. But I'm just going to like drag you back to the SEAL teams for a little okay. bit. Sure. Can. Um, so SEAL Team Five is West Coast. Yes, it is. Okay, so uh, Coronado. Yes. Yeah, bro. I went out to San Diego on that trip where I met you mm -hmm. and I was one day I was like gonna go for a swim and it, I forgot, it was like Jan Feb or something and I was like no fucking way am I getting in that water and then I was like oh they do buds here and I was like man buds must really suck <laughs> yeah I mean it's it's cold 
and it's wet. And that's a, it's a lot of cold and wet at Bud's. And it, it's just putting up with being miserable for for a long time. Yeah, six months of that, man. Yeah. Um, hey, dude, so sorry. I want to back to back to the SEAL team. Spinning so SEAL Team 5, 2007, you said you got there? Yep. Yeah. So that, that's still pretty high operational tempo for the SEALs, man. And then you've, you probably wouldn't have deployed for until 2008, if I'm not mistaken. Correct, yep. Yeah. Where was that deployment? So first deployment was actually to the Philippines. So I ended up uh, going to the Philippines and much, much different job there. And that when we deployed there, we're not deploying as our entire platoon deploys there, but we ended up getting broken apart and sent to different areas to be advisors to the Filipino. It, de and it depends. We're broken up to different areas, but I was sent to a Filipino Ranger Battalion in the South Mindanao area, a little island called Basilan. And if you ever talk to anyone from the Philippines about Basilan uh, or Mindanao, they're always like, oh, man, don't go down there. There's terrorists down there. It's it's bad because like it, it, it is like people get kidnapped, people get murdered, you know, bad things are happening. But it's very much like a um, it's not a super, super kinetic area for us. For us, like I would go on operations with these guys, but like I was under like specific instruction to like not be the guy kicking down the door, going in there. Number one, we're supposed to be like the guys in the back, kind of watching them do it and advising them. So that part was a little frustrating, but I took advantage of it as much as I could. So what I did was I did volunteer to go to language school prior to that deployment. So I volunteered to go to a language school and learn how to speak Tagalog. That way I could be more of an asset when I go there, when I went there. And it ended up becoming a good thing because because I spoke Tagalog, I ended up getting in on all the things that were happening. So anytime they needed a speaker, I'm being sent there to different operations that are going on, whether it be the Rangers or the the uh, Filipino NAVSAO, which is like their Filipino uh, SEAL equivalents doing operations, going after bad guys. And so I at least got to like get that kind of experience, which um, in all honesty, that's more of a traditional army special forces mission is like what army SF is really, really known for. They're really known for doing exactly that. But you know, us being seals, we do, we go wherever we're told to go, you know, but, uh, that, uh, was, a was like our first, first exposure to, to being overseas and dealing with terrorists. Cause like we got, you know, we, our base got murdered and shot at and things like that, but it was a much different, um, which just different environment you know i i always envisioned like going overseas and being like with your entire platoon taking down targets which you know we did get to eventually later on but um and that one was very much like i it was just me and like one or two other seals sometimes on these operations surrounded by a bunch of filipinos sometimes in the thick of the jungle um doing doing jungle operations yeah and and that's um in the australian collective consciousness we're not we're not aware of most of that type of stuff um because i know you guys do things in like yemen uh, and africa and a few places like that where in the australian for us we had our two main campaigns i mean we had like east timor in 99 to like 2008 or something but the rest of it was iraq afghanistan mm -hmm. so we we don't. I mean, there was some guys in the Philippines and doing another some little things like that, but we we didn't really do anything like that, um, especially at least that I'm aware of operationally getting shot at and murdered or, or going after terrorists in the Philippines. Man, that it's really interesting to me. Can you yeah. just kind of describe some of the things you guys were doing, look as as best you yep. can? So at the time, uh, there was a few different organizations that were all interconnected, the MNLF, the MILF, the Abu Sayyaf. Um, these are all terrorist organizations that were operating in the southern Philippines that were that had ties to Al-Qaeda and have received a lot of their funding through Al-Qaeda. And we were there to help the Filipino government combat that terrorism. And we did that in direct support. We also did it with um, with sending us as advisors to, you know, it's like we're supposed to be the experts at counterterrorism. So how can we help them free their country from terrorism, essentially? So 
we were there pretty much doing all, all these operations in conjunction with the Filipino military. And we were usually working with their higher tier units, like you know, their, their Ranger battalions and their, their, um, their Filipino nav sow Navy seal equivalents and things like that. Uh, which was just a whole different experience for me being, being sometimes alone or with one other American, you know, sometimes it was just like, I went through periods of time where I was speaking Tagalog, like for days at a time without even speaking English. So it was, it was interesting. It was, it was definitely yeah. very interesting. Um, but I did, I did, I got to travel around a lot. I, I got to see a lot of the Philippines because like I said, anytime there was something going on, they would send me around the country a little bit, uh, to be able to help out. So that was, that was interesting. And, uh, I knew that the thing that I definitely was going to do though, was after that deployment, I was like, listen, I'm going to Afghanistan period. Like I did, like, I was like, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not doing this again. You know what I mean? Like I spent two and a half years training for war. Yeah. I'm not doing Like I'm not doing this again. So, um, that was the one priority that I had leaving that, leaving that experience. Uh, I'm not going to say it was a horrible, horrible experience. Um, but I will say that it was just one that I did not join the SEAL teams to do. If I wanted to do that, I probably would have joined the Army Special Forces because, like, that's what they're known for. They're known for training and advising, and that's, like, their primary role. Um, but, like, I wanted to be a SEAL, and I wanted to go to war. I wanted to go alongside my my buddies and take down bad guys. And that's what I wanted to do. So leaving that deployment, I actually got the opportunity. Well, actually, no, sorry. Leaving that deployment, uh, a buddy of mine from my platoon ended up catching wind of this thing called the dog teams, you know, and I, this is something I barely ever heard of. Um, I had an experience learning about the dog teams as a brand new guy. And then I got to see him in action and see some of the things they were doing. And I was like, wow, this is freaking amazing. I was like, these dogs are freaking cool. That'd be really cool to get into. And then I learned about them after that platoon. And I was like, wow, at the time, every single dog team was deploying to Afghanistan because that's where we need them. We need them in the most kinetic areas where the ID threats are high, where, where the bad guys are. And so I was like, man, I, I want to go to the dog teams because if I go to the dog teams, number one, I get to work with dogs, which, which is super cool. And then two, it's a guaranteed ticket to Afghanistan. I know where I'm going. And for me to have yep. that, like that guaranteed ticket to know where you're going ahead of time is a, is a real powerful thing because I'll, I'll give you a little landscape of the situation. But at the time, not every SEAL platoon is deploying to Afghanistan. It's kind of like a slightly competitive, slightly luck, meaning that they evaluate the platoons, how they're doing, and then they decide which platoons go where. So sure enough, they might decide like, okay, this is a good platoon. This platoon is doing really good. Let's make this the Afghanistan platoon or, or these two platoons are going to Afghanistan. This one platoon is going to Yemen and this platoon is going to the Philippines. So they'll, they'll break it up. But I knew if I went to the dog teams, absolutely going to Afghanistan. So I, I want, I looked into it. I volunteered for it. I reached out and they said, sorry, it is full. Like we don't have any more billets. So that's it. I was like, all right, well, no big, like I, I wasn't like heartbroken. Um, because at the time I was slated to be a team leader in the, my, my platoon. And this platoon is pretty much slated already for going to Afghanistan. So I already kind of knew that the chance that we were pretty much most likely going to Afghanistan already. So we had that, we had that already down and I was slated to be a team leader. And my, even my platoon even kind of told me like, they don't want me leaving uh, to go to the dog teams because like we need everybody we can get, especially guys with experience to go to Afghanistan. And I was like, all right, cool. But then a directive comes out and this is like a war comm directive, meaning this is like so far above the, the platoon, the task unit, SEAL team. This is like a war comm directive which is all seal teams that they want to expand the dog teams by 100 percent now because the dog teams were being were so effective that they know they, need, they needed more of them so the first thing they did is they went down the list of all the guys that have been showing interest in the dog teams and they went down the list right then and there and contacted myself and a couple other guys and they were like do you want to come to the dog teams and i was like um I mean, yeah, but how much time do I have to decide? I mean, I'm, I'm a team leader, you know, I got stuff going on. Like, well, you don't give us an answer in the next 10 seconds. We have to go down the list and pick someone else. And I was like, <laughs> okay. So right then and there, I took a leap of faith and I was like, well, let's do this. You know, because there's a reason I was interested in it already. That reason still exists. And now I have the opportunity. Let's do this. So like the very next day I'm at the dog teams and I'm getting bit oh, by shit. every single dog. 
yeah, I'm, I'm getting bit by every single dog in the kennel. Not at the same time, but I think um, <laughs> it was it was kind of like a little informal training slash hazing because they they want you to know what you're in for at the dog teams. You're in for getting chewed on by a lot of dogs. And so that was like the first thing, you know, it's, it was probably like, you know, a 90 degree day in, in like August or something. It was, it was probably pretty warm and uh, sweat my ass off in a bite suit, getting bit by every single dog. And uh, the attitude I always tell people that is after you start getting bit by some of these dogs is that you either think it's uh, a little scary or you think it's really freaking cool. And I think that uh, I had a little bit of both. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, I was. I always used to shit my. I would still do it because I'm not a fucking yeah. pussy. But man, yeah. I used to shit myself when I was getting bitten by those damn things. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in, in to this day, uh, at the SEAL teams, we just have, you know, these dogs are being hand selected, hand picked to go combat terrorism. So these aren't your average mouths, your average duchies. These are man eaters. These are guys like I remember getting bit by some dogs that would bend bone. Like I would feel the bones in my body bending as they're biting me. Like some, some serious shit, some serious bites. Um, yeah. anybody that's, anybody that's in my generation, uh, there's some guys that remember a dog named Duke and this Duke was like a hundred, almost a hundred pound, uh, Dutch shepherd that would bend bones. Yeah. Duke. Yeah. And, and I, I don't think people, sometimes I don't think people appreciate how thick the bike suits are like what, a couple of inches thick, yep. m- maybe one inch thick, either side of your arm. And then, like, there's, you know, the tension that gets harder as they chew it, so then they can just chew through that and then, you know, crush bones. Like, I couldn't even imagine getting bitten by one with no bite suit if you're a legit bad guy. That would just be fucking devastating, man. Devastating. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. it is. It absolutely is. It's it's devastating. I mean, people don't – a lot of times uh, dog people – well, I'll just say people in general. They, they think dog bite. I'm like, ow, that dog bit me. Like, ow, that hurt. <laughs> And it's like, yeah, that's like when a golden retriever bites you or just some dog who's defensive biting you and things like that. And even some people that have taken a live bite off some dogs and dog training and stuff like that happens. But these dogs that are actually trained, that are selected and trained to go do what we do, like there's people missing triceps in, and these dogs, some of these dogs have kill counts, you know? So it's like, these dogs are mm-hmm. serious dogs. These dogs are very serious. Yeah. Yeah, I love that, man. That's so good. Yeah. <laughs> hey, so can you just talk us through the the, the 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 pipeline to go into the dogs? Like, What sort of stuff are you guys doing? Like obviously integrating CQB, maybe some like, you know, yep. gunfire, blast inoculation, that type of stuff. Oh, yeah. So the reason why the dog teams is at the time they only wanted to take experienced SEALs. They want to take guys that already have a deployment or two under their belt because – now you have to do everything that you can do as a seal with a four-legged man-eating toddler attached to you. So <laughs> <That's a lot. laughs> yeah, like you have you have to be able to do all the things you can do as a seal, but now you're doing it with a dog. And it's hard to do that if you're still a new guy trying to figure things out. So I was in a good position. And like the unique experience that I had was that at the time this wasn't really I didn't feel like I was lucky at the time, but the, the dog that I ended up getting ultimately paired up with was a green, green dog that was under a year old. And wow. Yeah. Which isn't common. Most of the dogs that guys are getting paired up with have already had deployments, you know, or they've already been through a course. They've already been, they've already been trained, but through consequence, well, the fir- I was actually paired up with two dogs prior that both ended up getting flushed from the program. So I only had each one of those dogs for like a few weeks, maybe a month, and they end up flushing them, which actually is the majority of the dogs that show up. So it's almost like a mini buds that goes on with these dogs that if they don't make the cut, they flush them. And it doesn't mean they get like youth and high strength thing. It's just like these dogs, <laughs> what we ask them to do is much different than what a police department asked them to do. So a lot of the dogs that we fail will end up at a police department. They'll end up even at like a government agency, like the FBI, the secret service, things like that. They'll still, the, they still go someplace to do something, but we need some truly, truly special dogs to be able to stick around. And that's why I think that it, just being there, gave me a very unique perspective of what true special dogs are. And I totally understand that some people are like, well, my dog's super special. Just like everyone's kid is super special to you, you know, but like that level of dog 
is a very rare thing. And I don't think people understand how rare of a thing that really is that we have to go through, you know, if we want to have 10 dogs, we, we might've had 30 dogs come through our program to get failed so that we can have 10. Yeah. And obviously you can speak to this better than I can in terms of the seals, but you're obviously looking for a, a dog that's got a great temperament that can be dealt with by a lot of people. It's got that nerve in a team environment when it's a bit dynamic, but can fucking can pull the trigger when they need to, and then go back to, to be calm and being able to be dealt with and padded and lifted over walls and exposed to explosives and helicopters. And um, yeah, cause you're not, you obviously you're not just looking for a dog that's a complete fucking maniac that yep. you point at the bad guy. You need them to operate in the gray space as well. It's exactly it. So you need this dog to think it's a badass. So all these dogs, we train them in a way that we, they think they're alpha badasses, but we can't let them be a liability to our team either. So they have to be social enough to be in a team and work in a dynamic team environment. They have to be environmentally stable as hell. They have to be inoculated to gunfire. Um, and they have to have a great nose, a great hunt drive. Uh, they have to have a really good balance of drives too. And, uh, the dog that I ended up getting paired up with, his name is Ido. And Ido. Yep. We ended up going through a handler course and, uh, the handler course was about like six to eight weeks. Uh, but when we showed up there, like I got paired up with him, like the day before the handler course. And we had to fly out to the East coast to Virginia to do this handler course. And I spent the first night with him, like just teaching him how to sit. <laughs> Cause like this dog knew nothing. Now the dog, the only thing the dog did prior to that was some fundamental odor recognition and imprinting. We did, we did some of that with the week leading up to it. But I, it's funny because I was training with this dog uh, to train him, but I didn't know I was being paired up with him yet. And then they ended up failing my dog just before I went to the handler course because basically the way they looked at it was like, hey, the dog he has, we're going to fail anyway. We may as well fail him now and put John through the handler course with the dog that we need to find out if this dog can cut it. The dog being so young, I remember the odds they gave me. I'm like, all right. And, and you can probably imagine how amused I was at the time. I was like, all right, so you're failing my dog that I just spent all this time with trying to train. And now you're giving me a dog that, what do you think the odds of this dog making it through the program? They're like, mm, about 50%. And I was like, so now I'm going through this handler course, like with a dog that like might not even make it through the program. And I, and I just know the math on this, that if I do this handler course and this dog doesn't make it through the program, this dog gets flushed. And then I have to start over with a new dog, which puts me back in the timetable for deploying. Yeah. So I'm just looking at this, like, what am I going to deploy? Like in like two years, like what is going on here? So I was frustrated. I was very, very frustrated, but I, I, once I was paired up with that dog, it's like, all right, well, it's like jumping out of an airplane. There's only one direction you're going down. So once I'm paired up with that dog, I'm like, all right, we're making the best of this. And like, I remember like, I don't advise people to have conversations with your dog, but like, I remember talking <laughs> to my dog and I'm like, I was like, listen, you and I are going to make it through this course and we are going to deploy. I was like, I hope you understand that <laughs> we are going to make this happen because uh, at the time my dog was very, very green. I among all the handlers looks like a smashed up bag of assholes because <laughs> these, these other, these other handlers have dogs that have confirmed kills. They have dogs that have already been on multiple deployments. They have dogs that have already gone through a handler course. And then there's me with the dog that doesn't even sit. And so I looked like it's very, and I'm sure you, you understand this, the, the reality of this, but it's really easy for someone to look good when they have a really well-trained dog. <laughs> Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 Hundred percent. Yeah. You hand a well-trained dog to someone who has no idea what they're doing. You can make them look good. You know what I mean? But like when you show up at the dog who doesn't know how to do anything, you look like Elmer Fudd. You look like a a dummy. And that's exactly what I looked like. And also, I was kind of a dummy in that, like, I was still learning at the time. But I um I invested all my time into learning. And so I would be doing the handler course during the day, and at night I'd take my dog home with me to the hotel. And I'm like training with my dog at night, just spending time with them, practicing sits, practicing stays, practicing healing, pra like just practicing anything that I could to make this dog better, which sometimes is just the basics of just basics, like walking on a hip lead with me everywhere, you know, like just mastering the basics so that when we show up to the handler course the next day, we're as prepared as we possibly can be. Yeah. And, and through the handler course, I will say that at the very beginning, we were absolutely, we were dead last of in all regards. By the time we left the handler course, we were winning. And, and I say winning in that, like we're just performing better than most of the other teams in the area of detection and, and doing very, and, and doing fairly well in apprehension 
in tracking and all and all the other disciplines, but we were starting to shine in detection. And for me, that like gave me the, I think we got something here. Like we we showed up here, absolute dead last. But now we're actually not dead last. We're actually winning some of these evolutions. Like we're actually outperforming some of these other dog teams. So for me, I absolutely had a chip on my shoulder a little bit because like I went from like, you know, being dead last dummy to like, I know what I'm doing. And I made it my goal was like, I want like, I didn't just want to deploy. I wanted to be the best handler team there. I wanted everyone to know who the best handler team was. And I wanted it to be me. So no matter what evolution we're doing, I'm like, okay, this evolution, we're doing the best. I don't care. There's four, five, six other dog teams. We're gonna we're gonna do the best in this evolution and every other dog team. As friendly as I am with their other handlers, and I want them to do good too, because I want them to deploy with good dogs. But like in my little micro, my micro mission, every evolution was to win. It wasn't just to like do an evolution. It was like, no, no, no. I want to be the best dog team. And that's what it was every single evolution. Yeah. And that's that's pretty incredible too, given that you had a green dog, like literally, I mean, to be under a year old in on the handler course is and that's pretty rare like I, I i'm surprised they they gave you a dog like that but that's fucking awesome that you end up getting and obviously you got the dog through right yes so that dog it made it through the the course and we ended up being paired up and we you know we stayed together for about two years so nice yep yeah yeah and uh you know that dog like through through all our deployments and um and time together like we some of like the, the accolades that I'll give him is that uh, we found this is going to skew the numbers because we found a huge cache that was like the biggest cache I think was ever found, but we found over 13,000 pounds of explosives. So at, yes. So as a number, um, I don't think there's another, like I haven't found it yet. It's not like there's like a, there's like a, a record book that I can go to like <laughs> look up a database. Yeah. But as of right now, unless someone wants to dethrone me, um, that dog has found more explosives than any other dog in the war on terror. And that's simply because we found a cache that was huge. Shit. Yeah. L let's, let's get to that, bro. Um, <laughs> and, and I just want to really quickly frame this for the people listening. You're not the typical seal in, in, in the sense that like your Instagram's not full of, you know, I was an Navy seal and I did this and I did that. And here's me, uh, surrounded. Like there's like a handful of pictures on your whole profile of you mm -hmm. in the SEAL teams, especially with with a dog, that type of stuff. So I know you're not like big on the, on the war stories and you don't want to be, you know, uh, like beating your chest, but um, can we go through some of the experiences in that first deployment, particularly Tor yeah. that one? <laughs> him. So actually, I mean, that, that was a good experience and I, and I really don't mind talking about that because this – gives a unique perspective on something called absolute threshold. And this is something that a lot of people don't know about in the scent world because it's not really a common thing. So when we train dogs to find explosives, we're usually using small amounts of like what a typical IED would be, or sometimes even smaller amounts because you figure, well, if a dog can find a thimble full of C4, it can find a two pound block of C4, right? Which is correct. But what happens when it has... 2000 pounds of C4, something changes. The analogy I use is like, if a dog took a shit in your house, you would be like, oh man, it smells like shit. And it smells like it's coming from this room and it smells like it's on this side of the room. Oh, there it is. <laughs> if somebody filled your house with 2000 pounds of shit, you would, have, <laughs> you would have no idea where it is. It would be so overwhelmingly awful pungent smell that it would be too difficult to even articulate where it's coming from. It would be too saturated with smell. So that's what dogs go through with something called absolute threshold. So on a particular operation, we knew that there was going to be a cache in this area and my dog caught odor. I caught odor and I see it doing like a, a zigzag in, in an odor cone. And I'm just like using the wind as a, you know, going, starting downwind and work my way upwind yeah, so I knew we're onto something. So I knew we were looking for a cache. I'm also being mindful about potential ID threats and things like that. But we're we're looking, and we eventually lose odor. And I'm like, hmm, that's weird. We were just, we were like it was like a sidewinder missile. So people that aren't familiar with um, a scent cone, a scent cone is uh, a cone which, if you get into a scent cone, you start wide. The dog is going side to side like a sidewinder missile. And then as you get closer, the dog will 
start going side to side less until it eventually reaches odor. And then it's like, boom, right, right on the odor. And that's usually where the IED would be. With this, the dog was doing that. But then as it started to narrow its its side to side, it would just lose odor. And then the dog is like air scenting in the air, doing circles. So I knew the dog was on something, but it kept losing the odor. So I went back and then retraced the odor. And I was like, man, there's something here. The dog's losing it. So I'm like, all right, use your brain, John, use your brain. Okay, we're losing scent. But the wind is this direction. Let's go upwind. So I just take, I go upwind by maybe like 20, 30 feet. And there's this bush that's kind of like covered up something. And so we, we move this bush out of the way and it, there's a hole. And in this hole, it was jam packed full of explosives. And there was some weapons, stuff like that, but it was mainly just explosives. And the intel we have is that all these were being shipped down to Helmand. So. Yeah. I, and I had guys, I had other seals that I knew down in Helmand and like that, that was taking some, some IED threat off the street because, um, they ended up like measuring the volume and coming up with like a weight, but they said it was something close to, it was something close to 13,000 pounds. It was huge. It was, uh, once you got oh. in there. Yeah. Once oh, you got in there. Sorry. Keep, keep going. Yeah. Yeah. Once we got in there, we uh, ended up pulling out all the explosives and stuff like that and seeing where it is. They're like, this is insane. Like, this is, it was a huge, huge, huge amount. And then uh, EOD ended up like, you know, setting up a charge. We ended up bipping it in place uh, and it made a huge freaking mushroom cloud. But, <laughs> but tell me you've got a video of that or a photo or something. You know, I don't. Uh, you know, I probably, it's something I probably should go find because I know someone somewhere has one somewhere. We probably should find one. Uh, to Definitely. be honest, like, the, I'll, I will tell you, this is the, one of the regrets I have a little bit is that I never took a lot of videos and pictures because I was so engrossed in what I was doing in the moment. You know, I was always so like in the moment, um, occupied with what I was doing and I never really took the time to like enjoy it, not, not, not enjoy it, but like, um, uh, like take a photo, just like do a photo op, take a quick little video, embrace what you're doing in the moment. Cause I think, uh, I almost felt like that was like, that was gonna be my life forever. I was like, oh, I'm just gonna keep deploying with my dog, keep doing this shit forever. It's gonna be cool. You know? Uh, yeah, that's like my mindset. Yeah. For, for context, man, for the the Aussie listeners, thirteen thousand pounds is five thousand eight hundred kilos. Oh, sorry, five thousand nine hundred. Yeah, that's it was a lot. like that's like three or four cars. That's huge. That's massive. Yes. yes. What what kind of explosives were they? Like just so just a shitty homemade explosive sort of thing. That was sodium chloride. So that was. Um... Not to get too technical here, but prior to that deployment, we were being drilled on urea as being like the primary um, explosive that we were looking for. So we did a lot of that in training, but but that particular area that I was operating in, we were finding a lot of sodium chloride. So that we were kind of having to shift our train. Now, it, my dog still was trained fundamentally how to detect that. But what I would do is every time we showed up at a target and I found explosive content, I would steal some of it in a bag and I'd take some of it back with me. And then I would have um, some of my partner force guys, my Afghani guys, go hide it for me. And so I'd have them go hide it, and I'd you know re kind of introduce my dogs to like the odor of what the enemy is actually planting to stay on top of like what we we're doing. So I was I was stealing that. I was stealing you know sometimes I would be stealing man dresses to, to ship back to the other dog teams that were um, that were training so i could give them obviously i can't just ship you know explosives but i would ship like clothing and, and articles and stuff like that and blankets to give them just so they could start getting smells of of the area and start associating that with um with what these dogs are training in nice man yeah and i guess that's that's a, a fairly standard thing in, a, in afghanistan and in iraq like different areas have different access to certain types of chemicals and there might be a particular style of like this guy here that makes IEDs. So, um, mm -hmm. mate, can you just oh, – because I want to ask a little bit more about that deployment and then then the next one, which has obviously had a, a big influence on you. What's like the role of the SEAL teams? What's the overarching – this is what a Navy SEAL does. So SEAL teams are fundamentally designed for direct action with the enemy whether it be by ambush, by raids, um, taking down high value targets. Uh, a lot of what we did was showing up and kidnapping people in the middle of the night, you know, 
not just random people, but kidnapping bad people. <laughs> That's uh, yeah, which is funny because I, I actually helped out once with like a woman abduction seminar, and I told them that I used to be a professional abductor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like what? And I was like, yeah, I was like, like, oh, I, I'm, like, I'm better now. It's all good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, but I was like, I used to be a professional abductor. I used to abduct people in the middle of the night. That's what I used to do. Um, but and you know, C. Aaron Land stands for you know, the SEAL team stands for C. Aaron Land, so we can do that with a lot of different insertion techniques, which is definitely what separates us from a lot of other units. Um, so we have the sea capability. We're all combat diver qualified. Um, you know, we do a lot of water operations, um, air. Everyone is jumping halo qualified, so we can all do high altitude jumping into targets. The land, you know, kind of self-explanatory. But uh, the, a lot of the things that ends up happening is the comparisons that everyone wants to compare SEALs to armies, you know, special forces to rangers to all these things and and to me it's like comparing apples to oranges because there's just so many they're so different uh but the one thing that we definitely have that the others don't and why the seal teams have kind of started the the, the infamous kind of you know legend of what seals are is because we have we have buds and we have hell week which no other no other training pipeline has anything like it really so that's the one thing that kind of separates us yeah okay all right so with that in mind you obviously direct action unit you guys are meant to go and fight the enemy face to face was that your primary role on that deployment you guys were like um uh like counter leadership sort of thing yeah so pretty much every deployment after my first one was like was ver was was direct action so that was the good part in that i did feel like what we were doing was seal related um but i'll tell you um I'll kind of skip to like even like just the last deployment that I that I pretty much did was we were a direct action task force that was working with um, the Afghanistan like their special forces and what was happening was is the mission has now changed so you know Afghanistan prior was like go fuck up the enemy which in, in all honesty was cool but. It then turns into, we don't care how many enemy you kill. We don't care how many bomb makers you take off the street. We don't care how many caches you find. No, that shit matters. What we care about is how capable your partner force is. Can they take over? And so the way they kind of forced our hand on that is like, okay, you start off taking like the beginning of the deployment. You have two Afghanistan commandos with you. And then like a couple of weeks later, now you take four, then you take six, then you take eight. And then it starts becoming, the numbers starts being skewed where before it was like 20%, 80%. Then it becomes 50, 50. And now it's like 30, 70. And then it starts to get into the realm of like 20, 80 and 10, 90. And it gets to a point now where it's like, we're kind of like an advisor role and these guys are doing it and it's starting to get a little dangerous. Uh, in that, in that regard. And then I'll give you some context, but like there was a Marine Raider unit that as they were stepping off the helicopter, one of their counter force guys turned around and started shooting them in the helicopter and killed a number of guys. Yeah. And so that's the kind of shit that can happen. So we quite literally on that last deployment, they, they, we had to take extra seals with us to ride in the helicopter because the air crew didn't want to fly the Afghan commandos unless there was an equal ratio of Americans to Afghanis. So we had SEALs go along for the ride as escorts for the commandos that they were, those guys were bringing on the mission, and then they would just go ride back home in the Chinook. <laughs> That'd be shit. A shit gig. He's to be like, I want to kill bad guys. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah. unfortunately, that, that kind of came at a time where we lost a guy – uh, his name was Chris Pike. We lost a guy in that deployment. And right after that, they it was like he got killed. And like the next day, they they upped our ratio. And it was really frustrating because like you're in this point of like you want to go find those guys and kill them. And now it's like you're babysitting uh, 30 to 40 Afghani commandos with like single digit number of seals. And so we really were getting handicapped and, and, and also like no one cared, like no one cared how many people we killed. 
Like no one, no one cared. No one cared if we if we killed any bad guys. No one, no one cared. You know, and yeah. um, like matter, matter of fact, like those Afghani commandos, they were kind of like a threat to us because we couldn't ever fully trust them. And on top of that, they were always like telling on us for doing something. Like I ended up getting borderline in trouble for um there were there's some kind of rumor that got started that i was like unleashing my dog to like bite bad guys that were like captured and um which was untrue <laughs> i my my dog was not biting captives um now did i ever have him in a muzzle during some interrogations you know maybe but like no one's getting bit that didn't deserve to get bit um, <laughs> yeah. i think that's what people forget yes 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 yeah you know, these aren't but, uh, fucking like your local bad guy, you know, stealing some fucking ice creams from the from the, the corner store. There's yeah. some bad dudes. Yeah, no, absolutely. And you know, not to get too too much into like the feelings of Afghani culture, but like some of the you know, shooting shooting bad guys, um, I don't think that ever left like a bad taste in my mouth because like all the guys that got shot very much I think deserved it. Um and I was fortunate in that there was definitely some seals that were put in bad positions um, that have, you know, had to kill kids and things like that. Sometimes on purpose, sometimes by accident uh, that are put in bad positions. I was very, very fortunate in that I never had a questionable scenario like that, but I just saw the treatment of how these Af the Afghanis were treating the children there. And that left the biggest impression on me of, of like my contempt for their treatment of, of kids and how they treat them, you know, so like for me, you know, we had to show up to different targets and different children that are being raped by their elders and things like that. And that's just like common practice for them. So it's like, if that was happening in America, if like, if I knew a neighbor of mine was doing that, there'd be like lynches and torches and we'd be going in there and dragging that guy out into the street if the police don't get to him first, you know? Uh, yeah. they're there, like the attitude is like, yeah, I, it's very unfortunate that they do that. You know, like, so when you're talking to people and this is going on next door, they're like, yeah, we don't do that. But you know, he, we just let him do his thing. It's like, what do you mean? Let them do their thing. You know, like they're abusing children. Like this is not right. And, um, us, we're not allowed to like do anything about it essentially. So, um, anytime yeah. we, anytime we found out that a bomb maker was doing that too, it made it extra, extra special for us. Because there's an opportunity to take one more off the street. Yeah, yeah. Th again, mate, that that's something a lot of people don't seem to realise is that uh, it's like yeah, there's there's the bad guys, the real real bad guys, terrorists, and, and the, some of the things they do. Like if you know, you take one of these guys, tell all the things they do in the media, and that they'd have a field day with it. But they don't. They choose to overlook it, and they'd rather they'd rather look at you because you you know hit some dude with a a dog in a muzzle. You know what I mean? Like yeah. it's it just seems so skewed, and the, the kid stuff for me, man, that they used to fuck me off so bad. Because um, the partner force would do it too, and we'd just be like, "Oh, you know, we're not here to sort of police that." And you're like, "Well, we should be." <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I mean, mean, we're here. We're here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, exactly. And it just shows like what the what the priority is, and of what we're doing over there. And it's it's. Um, I mean, obviously, we saw how that happened. Like they're. Pretty much they couldn't save themselves. So, you know, they let the Taliban come and take over again. So they had all the resources that they wanted to fight. You know, you have people clinging to the side. You have you have fighting age males willing to die clinging to the side of an airplane as it takes off and plummets their death. But they're not willing to grab a, a gun and, and defend themselves from, from tyranny. So, you know, I don't I feel bad for all the innocent women, innocent children. Um, but like. Their fighting edge males, you know, didn't do much fighting. So, yeah, 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 and uh, I, I agree, mate. That was um, I I didn't think it would happen so fast, but when it did, I was like, yeah, I'm not surprised. Like yeah, guys like you or me who've who've seen those guys, we're like, yeah. I mean, I could have told you that twenty years or not twenty years ago. I could I could have told you that ten years ago. This is not yeah. a surprise to me at all. No, that's exactly it, and. uh you know, when you give the Taliban an expiration date of when you're leaving, it gives them a lot of le a lot of leeway, you know? So we basically showed our hand and told it. I mean, it was so, I'm not here to like be a political commentator, but basically, <laughs> basically it's like, we told the Taliban, 
the, the government was actually in, in contact with the Taliban at the time, but they were like, Hey, we're leaving. Um, but we're, it's, it's taken a little bit longer than we thought. And the Taliban was like, well, you better be gone by this date. And we're like, Oh, okay. Okay. If you say so Taliban, we'll do whatever you want. And then the Taliban was like, Hey, by the way, like, um, if you're not going to secure the city, like we're going to have to take the city because it's just anarchy in the streets. And then they're like, okay, go ahead. You take it. So then the Taliban takes the entire city. So, okay, cool. Now we're just a little airport, you know, surrounded by, uh, hordes of people that are trying to get on board, you know, and, um, you know, I have one of our, one of our clients, uh, well, I'll say one of our veterans for the rescue 22 foundation, uh, got severely injured at, at the Abbey gate bombing. And so, you know, I have a little bit of contempt for the way that was treated and the way that we withdrew because there's a lot of deaths and a lot of maimed veterans that are maimed for life that are, um, you know, the cause was a bad pullout. And, you know, the SEAL teams, we have a community of of taking responsibility for things so that if you mess up, you're like the first to volunteer it. You're usually the one, the first one to stand up and say, I messed up, but this is how we're going to do better. Um, and then, of course, our government is pretty much like completely blameless uh, in you know, they, they're not willing to take responsibility for anything. So. Yeah, man. Yeah. The, 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 the politics thing, right. We, we've, we had a bit of a thing going on here. Um, I won't go too deep into it, but we had a, a thing going on here where a bunch of guys were accused of some war crimes and our highest ranked military officer, the chief of the Australian defense force gave this, you know, public apology to the Afghan people. And at this stage, it was it was rumors, it was innuendo, it was accusations, media shitstorm. Yeah. Gave this big, you know, crocodile tears apology on TV. And then uh, yeah. that was like four or five years ago, something like that. And only just recently, they've issued like an apology to um, the, the, the members of the Australian Defence Force in regards to like suicide and mental health and lack of treatment and blah, 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 blah. So, yeah. I mean, it's just... Uh, the lack of accountability is astounding. Yep. Absolutely astounding. I mean, it's yep. we shouldn't be surprised, but it's still and you're still just kind of like, wow. Yep. Really? Yeah. <laughs> really? Two weeks? Yeah. I mean, I, I pretty much was not very political my entire time in the military. I was too focused on the mission and what we're doing. So like I didn't care who the president was. I didn't care like it wasn't my job to dictate policy. You know, my job was to make sure that we found IEDs and that the guy next to me came home and that we, you know, put, put five, five, six rounds on, on foreheads and, uh, and did our job and came home. Uh, it really wasn't until Benghazi happened that I started like opening my eyes up a little bit to like the political sphere of how incestuous the political arena is. You know, when I had, um, you know, got, there's a couple of seals that died over in Benghazi and, and I was like, I, I knew, knew them, knew both of them actually. And, uh, I got to see some of the videos that were taken during Benghazi and things like that. And uh, that's not what bothered me a hundred percent. It was like what bothered me during the political theater afterwards. And I didn't understand it. I was like, why can't you just say what happened? Like, this doesn't make any sense. Why can't we just say what happened? And then it didn't start, you know, coming to light until years and years and years later. And, and the theme that uh, politics usually the Mach 1 motto playbook that politics uses, they use uh, in the political theater is that you delay, delay, delay. And so by the time the truth comes out, no one gives a shit. It's old news now. Mate, that, that's, and it works. Yeah. Doesn't it work, man? Like, I, I get, and, and I'm the same. I'm not really a political guy. I just, things will get my, get my, my blood, my blood up and my back up, but I, yeah. I mostly don't give a shit. But yeah, like some of the, a lot of these little conspiracy theories and stuff that that people were talking about for years, and that comes out like, oh, it was true. Everyone's just like, oh, oh well, <laughs> next. So yeah. it's, I mean, it's a tactic that works, right? Um, can, oh, can we round up that deployment just really, really quickly? So, no, sure. how often, the, as in the, the, the second one, and then I want to hit that okay. third one because that's going to help us talk about your transition out of the military. Yeah. Um, were you guys seeing a lot of action on that second deployment, like with your dog? Like, did you guys get any bites, or was it mostly um, counter ID stuff? Um, so mostly counter ID stuff was was mostly of what we're doing. Now, there's definitely there's some biting scenarios, but the 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 attitude that I kind of had at the time was like, why would I send my dog in to bite somebody when I can just shoot them? And 
the thing that I think people as handlers need to separate themselves from is the ego. Because I think a lot of people, they want to get, and I saw this in action from multiple different branches and multiple different canine handlers and stuff like that. But a lot of guys had an ego of like, they wanted to get the most bites they possibly could because it was like, it's cool. And you get to say, oh, I came back from that deployment with 30 live bites. And it's like, yeah, but how many times did you needlessly endanger your dog for no reason? And so if I had to send my dog on a bite for a good reason, then absolutely, I'm not hesitating. But if I'm just sending my dog to get a bite for no reason, when I can just throw a frag in a room or shoot a guy in the face, there's no reason to send your dog in. So I think, that honestly, one of the biggest things is handlers need to know when not to send your dog. And uh, and what's a good scenario to send your dog in? Because my attitude was like, I never sent my dog into a room unless I was willing to go in that room right after him. Uh, but sometimes when you're working with different teams, because I'll give you a, a little background, but being a canine handler, you end up operating with different platoons sometimes. So sometimes there's a little bit of like getting integrated with that platoon of how they do things versus how the last platoon that you worked with did. And so some of that could also be like the leadership in that platoon can have varying experience with working with canines. So I've been, I've been, I've worked with everything from platoons that have never worked with a dog really in theater ever to ones that already had kind of have and have some background and experience. So it, it, it's, it's good and bad in both ways because sometimes they've worked with a dog before and maybe that dog team they worked with before wasn't that good. And so that now they don't understand the capabilities that you truly have, you know? So it can hold you back a little bit. It'd be like if somebody worked with a sniper, but the snipers they had before couldn't hit the broadside of a barn, they're never going to use them because they're like, oh, yeah, I mean, like, we'll just drop a JDAM. <laughs> Why? We have a sniper with <laughs> a 300 Win Mag. We can just take them out right now. Um, but so there's a little bit of it. You have to educate your leadership there and teach them how you are you are an asset and make yourself an asset. And uh, that's definitely something I, I would have to do almost almost every, every time. Uh, but... I will say that as a, as a multi-purpose canine handler, the most important thing is to have a nose, is to have a killer nose. Like I would rather have a yellow lab with an awesome nose than a Malinois that can't smell shit because that Malinois that I had, he could smell an IED from literally a mile away, which he found that cache from about a mile away. Yeah, it was about a mile away, down downwind. Wow. Um, and... I would rather have a good nose and an okay bite than a, than the best bite dog in the world that can't smell shit because I can always shoot a bad guy, but I can't find an IED the way they can. Yeah. And in, in terms of that sort of stuff, your direct contact with the enemy, was that a common thing for you or were you trying to keep yourself separate from that first in the um, door sort of stuff? Cause you're like, I'm best utilized here. So it, it really depends because we would often use the dog to clear rooms before we go in. Yeah. So if we're going to make entry, if, and that's really the best attitude to have. And I think that law enforcement needs to work a little bit better at this as well. But we don't, we don't just send the dog in to like explore and be like, and, th and then make a decision. It's like, no, you sent the dog in because we're making entry. Like we've already committed, like we're going to enter this room. So why not send the dog in? We're going to enter it anyway. So we send the dog in ahead of us. That way, if there's anyone hiding, there's an ID threat, anything like dog's going to find it and, and we're going to make entry. And that was a really good layer of defense to save lives because there's been plenty of dog teams, you know, not including me, but like the, yes, dogs do get killed overseas. Um, and we don't want that to happen. We don't want that to happen. We're not trying to send these dogs to the, to their death, but if anyone's going to take a bullet or take a, take an IED, like we'd rather it be the dog than, than a person. And that's the truth. And it's a morbid truth, but that's the truth. Um, they're there to protect our lives. Even if, even if it is at the cost of their own, uh, but just, not needlessly. Yeah, no, I I agree, man. I think that's the that's that ugly one percent truth that uh, you don't often talk about because I mean I, I I've I've never done that, but I mean yeah, it's it's that little one percenter that it's like, well, if we're in that one percent scenario, this is the tool we're going to have to use, and you give them every opportunity, right? You still you'll frag the room, you'll yeah. I don't know put some nine mags in there, or you know whatever you can. But ultimately, you're like, someone's going to go in there to get this dude because we can't drop a bomb on it, can't shoot him with a sniper, et cetera, et cetera. So, yep. um, so, mate, can you run us through that next deployment and then 
because then I want to start talking about your post-military career because you're doing a lot of stuff outside the military. Um, yep. What was that one like? And give me a, a, I want an, a, an idea of how you were feeling at the end of that deployment. Cool. So, and this is like with my, with my last deployment, correct? Correct. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, okay. So the, the my last deployment, I I kind of left it feeling a little frustrated. Um, I'll give you a, I'll give you a story, but while I was there, I'm in Afghanistan and the agreement that I had was that one, I loved being at the dog teams and that I, I knew that no matter what happened after this deployment, I wanted to stay at the dog teams to continue working with my dog. And then even at the worst is like continue training other dog teams. Cause like at the time I was one of the the strongest handler teams there. And, and then, and I say that, but like, honestly, I think with the dog that I had, I was the strongest dog team there and that like, there was not another dog team there that could outperform us in any uh, scenario of detection. There were some other dogs there that, that definitely maybe had the edge on some apprehension work um, because we had, like I said, we had some dogs that were bone crushing maniacs, but, um, but as far as ID threats go, like there was no dog there at the kennel that I would say could beat what I had for a capability. And I give a lot of that to just pure genetic talent with the dog that I was paired up with. But but I did. I, I learned a lot, and I really wanted to make sure to continue that knowledge forward. Uh, but while I was in Afghanistan, this there was a little bit of a shift in the organization of the dog teams. So they shifted from having organic billets at the dog teams to now no longer were they going to have handlers at the dog teams anymore. It was going to be handlers at the SEAL team only. And then the SEAL team was going to send guys, TAD, to be handlers at the dog team. So it was just a shift in organization. And this was happening while I'm on deployment, like going after targets, you know, every night. And I, no one even told me about this. And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. what do you mean? So <laughs> what does this mean for me? And so I'm like emailing, uh, you know, from Afghanistan to, to command and like being like, Hey, what's, what's going on? And I'm not getting any responses. And so eventually I have to, I have to like wake up at like three o'clock in the morning or two o'clock in the morning. So I can like call back to America to be like, call, literally calling the office of the dog teams and be like, hey, man, what is going on with my orders? And they're like, oh, yeah, your orders. Um, yeah, you don't have any. <laughs> I'm like, interesting. Uh, so what do we do from here? And he's like, well, we're only going to have, um, I don't want to call this guy out, but like he was, this was his job. He was the admin. He was the chief at the dog team. So like he's supposed to be taking care of this, especially while well, my job at the time was to kill terrorists and get, protect get the bodies. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And. He's like, well, you probably should call um, the SEAL teams and see if they'll take you as a dog handler. And I'm like, are you kidding me? I was like, is this something you can do? And he's like, well, you know, they don't really like me over there because long story short, but uh, this chief ended up getting fired from one of the SEAL teams for fucking up really bad. Um, but so I'm like, literally now I'm like on the phone calling different SEAL teams like, hey, man, this is the scenario. Billets no longer have a job here can I come to your team to, to be a handler? And the problem was so much time has gone by now that all the billets and the orders are already done. So there's no billets to give out because all the guys already have their orders. So the, basically the response that I was given was like, we'll take you. But the only problem is you're going to have to find a guy to give up their orders because we're out of billets. We're out of space. Like we don't have any more billets to bring into this team. And I was like, holy crap. So you're basically saying I have to convince another SEAL that instead of deploying and doing badass shit, they have they they are gonna just like give that up and go do something else, which can happen under very unique circumstances. Like there could be a guy that like maybe his has a tragedy in the family and doesn't want to deploy or something like that. But that is like completely like not our culture. Our culture is like everybody wants to deploy and go overseas and do something. So unfortunately. Um, that basically meant that was the end of my time with the dog teams because like my billet was gone. I, I no longer had a billet there. So I get back off the deployment and I'm like, well, what am I supposed to do? Um, I decide that I'm going to basically do the best I can to spread some knowledge of the dog teams while, while my billet was running up and I get, I got a couple surgeries done just to get, just to get fixed up and, um, from a couple lingering injuries and that's where I was like faced with this decision of like, do I, I got offered to go to Guam to be a country action officer for like the Pacific theater. And I was like, man, 
that's not really what I want to do. I've already been to the Philippines. I know what that's all about. Not really crazy about that. They're like, well, you can be an instructor at Buds, SQT. I was like, man, like, I don't know. Like, that's just not what I want to do. Like, I, I know some people love going to be an instructor and no qualms in that. We need badass dudes to like bring the next generation of SEALs in here. Totally very, very admirable job. It's a lot of work, but it just wasn't what I was interested in. I wasn't interested in like wearing an instructor t-shirt and just like yelling at people. Um, that's not what I wanted to do. It's never really been my style. I just wanted to go overseas and, and my newfound passion was like working with the dogs. And so I was trying to engineer a way to do that. And then my enlistment was coming up and I was like, wow, I don't think I can reenlist for this. I can't, I can't dedicate another decade of my life to something that I don't want to do, you know? So that's where I made the decision of getting out and ended up getting out. And I, and like I said, I, I kind of saw the writing on the wall with that last deployment where the ratio kept getting pumped up and pumped up and pumped up until we weren't really even really operating anymore. And it became really frustrating and infuriating. And, uh, I was just, just got to the point where it's like, this isn't, this isn't seal shit anymore. This is like babysitting shit. And as much as I love what I did, the seal teams. And, uh, if I could do it again, I do it again in a heartbeat. Um, you can't live in the past. You, like the, the, what you did, what you did the year before and two years, three years before isn't what it's going to be forever. So you kind of have to adapt and change the times. And I, I looked at it like, well, if, if I'm not happy doing that, I need to find something else that, that gives me that desire to want to keep, keep going. So, so to be honest, when I actually first got out of the SEAL teams, like I didn't, I didn't really get out to be a dog trainer. I didn't get out to like, this is what I'm doing for the rest of my life. I did it because when I got out, I didn't, when they actually, it started with when I took my dog back, when they took my dog away from me, I, um, I didn't know what else to do. So I ended up going out and adopting a dog and started training it just for something to do because, uh. I was kind of lost without my dog. I went through, I went through years of my life was with this dog and now I no longer had it. And I felt, um, incomplete really, you know, I didn't really have, um, the desire to do anything else unless it was working with dogs. So I, um, I already kind of had a reputation in, in the SEAL community of my, of my guys. Whenever they had dog questions and stuff like that, they'd come to me because I, you know, was very passionate about dogs uh, matter of fact, while I was in, I was going to seminars and reaching out to trainers all over the world. Just I was like trying to learn everything I could about dog training. And like I said, it wasn't because I was going to be a dog trainer. It's just because training my dog, my life depended on it. So I trained my dog like, every day and tried to learn something new because, because I knew the more I knew, the more capable my dog was, the uh, better chances we had of coming home. So I went from like that mentality to not even having a dog. And I'm like, crap, what do I do? Well, I needed a project. So I go and I, I'm looking at dogs to adopt. And like at the time, you know, adopting, adopting like a multi poo or a golden retriever didn't seem like the thing to do. So I actually found like this Mal Shepherd mix that was like almost deemed unadoptable because it had been returned multiple times already. And I ended up going and reaching out and talking to them. And they reluctantly gave me some information, but I was like, I had to kind of, given my background i was like all right full disclosure i'm a seal i was a former seal canine handler um you know i they took my dog away from me and i'm just looking for a project and they're like oh all right in that case why, why don't you come up and take a look so i went up took a look at the dog and you know did some tests on it and i was like man this dog has a lot of drive this dog is is actually pretty good i was like i want to take it and uh the dog's name is Jean, and i actually still have her she's retired she's far far retired now but she's about 11 years old now <laughs> yeah and uh and she's, uh, you know, very, very living the retired old lady status right now. But uh, th that dog actually became my demo dog through, like, I was training that dog. And it was very reactive to, to people, to dogs, you know, to a lot of things. But um, I trained it. And everyone thought that dog was awesome. So people were like, oh, my gosh, your dog is so awesome. Like, could I have a dog like that? I'm like, well, yeah. Well, what that morphed into is, like, one, people had dogs already. that They wanted to have better trained. So I started doing free dog training meetups in the park. So I'm talking like I'm in the park at Balboa in San Diego doing free dog training. So people could just bring their dogs and I would just train it. And so for me, 
I was just getting reps of helping people. So there's rep after rep after rep, people showing up. And, and eventually the group grew to like 30 something people, 40 something people, 50 something people showing up. And I'm like, holy crap, this is getting too much. And then people were like, we love what you're doing, but we want more of it. Can I hire you? And I'm like, I guess. Yeah. I mean, I like training dogs and I'd love to keep working with you. Like, well, how much do you charge? I was like, shit, I don't know. How much do I charge? <laughs> like, um, and then I, and so then I had a number of people doing that and I'm like, all right, well, I guess if I'm going to be charging people money, I should have like an LLC and maybe a business bank account and like, oh, there's this taxes thing. And like, you know, so it, it very much, you know, I had to teach myself how to run a business. Um, and that was very much the behavior side of things. But then on the other part of things, I was doing like protection demos with my dog, showing people how bite work worked and things. And people were like, my gosh, like I want a dog like that. Like how much would it cost to get a dog like that? And I was like, well, I was like, if I was, if I was going to get a dog like this, I'd be going overseas and I'd be selecting it from like, you know, top stock of vendors and things like that. And then I'd have to import it. Then I'd have to train it. It probably takes six months to a year. Like it'd be, I'd be like, it'd be, be a lot of money. And they're like, well, I have a lot of money and I really want a dog like that. And I'm like, okay. They're like, name a number. I'm like, um, I just like some quick calculation, a guesstimate in my brain of how much it would cost to do this. I'm like, oh, maybe like $30,000. And they're like, done. I'm like, done. Like, yeah. I was like, uh, okay. <laughs> uh, and I did that times like four or five people. And then that was my first buy trip to Europe. So I went overseas. I, went, I talked to a lot of the same vendors that we use for the SEAL teams. And I uh, selected a bunch of dogs, brought them back to San Diego, put them in my garage and crates, and then trained them from there. And uh, it, was, it was a lot, a lot, a lot of work. Um, but that was like my first generation of protection dogs. And, uh, you know, from there, you know, we've, we've grown from my garage in San Diego, but that's, uh, that's pretty much how it started, you know, doing behavior mod, doing protection dogs. And then the service dog side of things was, so I had friends that were getting out of the teams and a lot of these guys are, are struggling. And so one of the first things that our, our group of friends wanted to do was get dogs for a lot of our, our buddies that needed them. So in particular, I had one good buddy on the East coast there getting out. He's definitely struggling, um, you know, mentally and physically. And we trained him a dog just to be able to help him. And at the time I wasn't even like, making this a career of, of, I was just doing it because I just wanted to help a buddy and I did it. And I'm like, wow. I was like, that felt really good. Like I, the fulfillment that I got from like helping a veteran and helping them in their life was like almost the same fulfillment I got from like finding an IED that guys aren't stepping on. And I met up with uh, another buddy of mine that was an army ranger that was doing very similar things to me on the East coast. And he introduced me to Angela Connor, who together we ended up coming up with this idea of doing a nonprofit to be able to do service dogs for veterans. And the premise was, I was like, well, what if we could do this in a way that we could continue replicating and it wouldn't cost us a crap ton of money? Because before it was like, I did, I, if I did a dog for free for somebody, I could do that like one time, but like I couldn't do that 20 times. I'd be broke. You know, but like if we were able to create a legit nonprofit mm -hmm. to actually be able to continually train these dogs in a replicatable model, that would be huge. Like we could be making a serious dent in this pandemic that we have going on with losing our veterans. So that's how that's how Rescue 22 started. And now, you know, we just started doing single digit dogs. And, you know, now we now we have, um, you know, double digit dogs that are placed all over the all over the country. You know, I got three dogs right now that are in training just at my place. There's, um, there's, I think, five or six more that are just in training right now at various other locations around the country. And, uh, you know, we're continuing to get service dogs in the hands of veterans that need them the most. Yeah, that's very admirable, man. And the the, the 22 thing, if I'm not mistaken, that's um, – and I know this statistic's been, um, like, debated by some people, but it's, it's an average yeah. of, like, you lose 22 veterans a day – to suicide if i'm not mistaken yes so that that is the the unofficial number but the numbers that are coming out now is that is actually even more than that really you know, so yes Shit. Yep. yeah yeah I mean, I mean uh 
the sad thing was a few years ago, I made the realization that I've lost more friends from suicide than I have in combat. That was like the the turning point in my life where I was like, wow, this war isn't over. You know, this war is not over. Um, this war is just starting as far as the the combating um, mental and physical health for veterans. Yeah. Yeah. And sort of dovetailing what we were talking about before with the post Afghanistan, the fall, non accountability, like the reason I love business, and I'm sure it's the same with you, is because I can solve problems that I know that the, the government, the subunits are not going to solve. Yep. Or they, they want to solve them, but they're incapable because they're bureaucratically bound by, you know, whatever dog shit process or funding or whatever. I'm sure it's the same with you, right? You've, you've gone, well, I know you're not taking care of these people. I'm going to give it a red hot crack. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like, like now it's like, I'm not waiting for the government to step in and save our veterans. I think that what we're trying to do at Rescue 22 is that we're trying to save as many veterans as we can with the resources that we have. And on top of that, we want to be a good example and a good model for that. If anyone else wants to get involved in the, in the veteran nonprofit space, that we're a good example of that. Because I do believe that the veteran nonprofit space itself is in a bad place because we have so many nonprofits out there that are just these um, marketing and fundraising machines that will raise millions and millions of dollars and do very little with the dollars that are spent. I I judge nonprofits on like the uh, the dollars they take in versus what they actually do. You know, I call it like impact per dollar. I made up this term. People love the acronyms. The the IPD impact per dollar. <laughs> you know, but like if you get a million dollars in donations, fundraising, stuff like that, you should be able to articulate what difference that million dollars that you're getting is doing. And I advocate that every single person that wants to cut a check to a nonprofit, go look at their taxes. It's public. It's not like a private business where like, you can't go look at divine canines and see my tax forms, but you can go look up rescue 22 right now. If you wanted to, you could look it up right now, see where our money is going, where we got it from and what we're doing with it. And I'm proud for someone to go look at our taxes and see what we do with our dollars. But you'd be surprised when you look up these bigger nonprofits of what they're actually doing with their dollars. It will surprise a lot of people. Yeah. And so what about yourself then? If, if you've got out, you're in a bit of a funky space, but you enjoy helping people. Do you, Have you found that the Rescue 22 Foundation or even just what you do in general work-wise helps you personally you know, be fulfilled or, or overcome any demons you might have like – is that, have you found that? Absolutely. Absolutely. One, I came from a place. So I'll just talk about dog training in general. And also, also you know, you being in the, in the dog space, it's like, you're going to probably understand this a little bit. I operate like on the fringes of the dog training world because like, I'm not super in deep with all the dog politics and things like that. I'm just not, uh, in my, in my opinion, like a lot of the people now, now don't get me wrong. Some of the greatest people I know are involved in, in the dog world but there's a lot of people involved in the dog world that are freaking nuts. They're nuts and they're very, very emotional. And they, a lot of times they get involved in dogs because they hate people. They're like, I hate people. I don't want to deal with people. I'm just going to deal with dogs and train dogs. Okay, cool. But what you don't realize is that in dog training, you have to deal with people. And the reason why I actually got involved with dogs, you know, going, you know, going all the way back to the, my beginnings here, it's not because I hated people. I got involved in dogs because I loved people. Like I wanted, I wanted these dogs to be able to help bring my buddies home. So yes, I thought dogs are, were cool, you know, and I loved my dog, but like I didn't do it because I hated people, you know. And I think that dogs have been helping people for thousands and thousands of years. I mean, the guesstimate is thirty-five thousand years. And that, and that is what their purpose is. Is like the dogs. A dog's purpose is to work with people. If it wasn't that, it would be a wolf. You know, that's the difference. Dogs were created by people to help people. And so dogs, the happiest dogs I know are dogs that are working with people and feel like they have a purpose. So telling, so telling, John. Uh, like I always, I've always said, man, the dogs are just a metaphor for us. 
Same as in the military. I'm like the way the hierarchy treats the dogs is very indicative of how we get treated. Yep. Same, same post career. You know, like, like you said, a dog that's got a purpose, has got a mission that's achieving, helping is a, is a happy dog. You've, it's the exact same for people, man. Yep. Um, d- dude, t- take me through. Uh, and again, this is what's what, what reminded me to, to get you on the podcast. You've done a bunch of stuff with uh, black rock for coffee recently. Um, Talk me through what you you're doing with them. Have they noticed Rescue Twenty Two and gone fucking come on board, or is it something different? So it's uh, it's a lot of different things intersecting. Because I'll give you one example. So one of our one of our uh, board members, Byron. So he was involved in training and placing a dog for Matt Best, and so that gave them like direct exposure to Rescue Twenty Two. But then also Black Rebel Coffee. Other people that are involved in the in the corporation have been noticing Rescue Twenty Two as well. So we've we've been crossing paths multiple times, and they reached out to us um, last summer and like they they voiced their their wanting to get involved in helping our mission. And you know we came up with a plan and and put some things together. They ended up donating they donated some money, and then uh, they even let us know then that they wanted to do a like a documentary episode on us to like let people know what we do in, in the, our mission. And then, uh, and then I ended up, you know, spinning that up and being like, Hey, we want to put you on a, on an episode of the, of our series. And we, uh, came up with a time and, and a place. And so we all met at Byron's facility on the East coast. Cause, uh, if you guys don't know, Byron's out in, uh, the Fort Walden beach area in Florida it has a beautiful, beautiful facility. So if you're ever in that neighborhood, want to do anything dog related i definitely uh, implore you check him out uh but he ended up hosting us to have black ripple coffee and you know the rescue 22 crew come out there we ended up inviting some of our veterans that have received dogs some of our board members uh went out there to get interviewed and they uh interviewed us to get to know the story of what we do and uh it was a really great platform for doing it and they're they're putting that together right now so that should be out within the month uh, and you'll be able to see that one nice and like, how fulfilling is that to be recognised by someone? So, because Black Rifle is massive, right? They're like a publicly listed company. Yeah, yeah, they're a pretty big company. And and to be honest, it's like, I, I haven't really ever really operated on like public praise, um, because like to be honest, when I was a SEAL, I didn't operate from the public being like, "Wow, Navy SEALs are so cool." That's not what like what fueled me. What fueled me was being next to the guys next to me and being being with them being part of a team and then when i was at the dog teams it's like being part of a team and saving and saving lives and so what fuels me every day is the veterans that we save for rescue 22 you know what fuels me today is the dogs that i save through divine canines that need behavior modification um through the clients that reach out that want protection dogs that now feel safe in their own homes that feel safe in los angeles here you know with all the crime that's going on in la um, that's what drives me every day in black river coffee. Like I appreciate their support so much, so, so much, but it's not like just the recognition for me. It's like black rifle coffee. Uh, they're a very, uh, veteran orientated brand. And what they bring to the table is a whole set of like resources and exposure that we wouldn't have anywhere else. They've spent years and years building that brand up into what it is. And for them to be willing to share that exposure with us is just to help our mission is huge. So I look at it as like the impact per dollar. Like now it's like what impact are we making uh, or what impact are we able to make with every dollar that we get and uh, getting that, that exposure through the, through them is huge because now it brings more people into knowing what we're doing, whether it be a veteran that reaches out that needs a dog to donors that are going to donate money to other corporations and other companies that believe in our mission that want to reach out and donate. Like, you know, that, everything is huge. Every dollar counts, you know, especially with the, if you ever look at our, our taxes, which I, like I said, I dare, I dare you to put it up there, but uh, you'll see what you'll, you'll see, what we, you'll see what we pay ourselves, which is nothing. None of us take any money yeah. from this. You know, we, uh, we have no person on our board is drawing a salary. Every dollar that we get is going into the nonprofit. Now, if Angela were here, she would correct me. She'd be like, Hey John, make sure to say 95 cents of every dollar because it like gives us some wiggle room in case there's like, you know, something on like spending money on something. But yeah, like yeah, I can you say, sign or, yeah, yeah, exactly, like, exactly. But I can say with, um, with very, com- with great confidence that 95 cents of every dollar goes to direct support 
of our mission and our veterans and be careful of wordsmithing because what nonprofits like to do is they'll do this. They'll be like 95 cents of every dollar goes to direct support of our mission and future planning. <laughs> wait, 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 what'd you say? You said direct support of veterans, but what was the last thing you said? Yeah. And future plan. yeah. <laughs> it's like they said, and future planning. What does that mean? Oh, that means that's the $58 million they have in a hedge fund right now. <laughs> that's what that means. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I've got a couple of mates here that run a charity for, for former Green Berets like myself. Um, yeah. We don't call ourselves Green Berets, but for you. Um, yeah. Yeah. And yeah, it's the same yeah. thing, man. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're very, very conscious about where the money goes, how they're perceived, making sure that they're like, hey, we're not fucking filling our coffers. Um, yeah. And then that's the critique they have of a lot of other uh, a lot of other charities that do the same thing or, or similar. Um, yeah. Hey, bro, I've got two more, two more questions for you. One is a slightly curly one, and then the other one's gonna. Um, it's just about what you're doing in the future, but. Sure. Um, like I said before, you're not you're not really fluffing yourself up a lot on social media. You're not posting a heap of, of military photos and whatnot. Um, even in this podcast, you, you you you're not delving too deep into some of the specifics. Like, ah, kick the door open, you shot him in the face. Yep. Um, what's what's the reception been like in the SEAL community to you going into business and um, okay. you know, podcasts and anything? Yep. Just in general, what's been the reception? So I'll definitely say it's mixed. It's a it's it's absolutely mixed reception because um, from other seals that are out, it's almost unanimously supported from every seal that's out. Uh, there are some seals that are in that look at being in the public at all as a negative thing, and I just come to like accept it because like when you're in, you are in a different mentality. You have a different mentality, different headspace because like you're in and your mission is the seal teams and like any seal doing anything public to them is just making what they're doing more public. And so I, and I do understand that I do get it, but everything changes when you get out When those guys get out, they're going to completely understand because I do think that I'll give the analogy because I struggled with this for the first year that I was doing dog training. I wasn't even telling people I was a seal. I did not, I didn't tell it. Like there's some people who knew, but I didn't tell because I had this chip on my shoulder and I wanted people to, to hire me and like me because I knew what I was doing in dog training, not because I was a seal. So I was kind of not really promoting it, but a good buddy of mine, the way he broke it down would be like, Hey, if you're hiring a lawyer, would you want your lawyer to hide the fact that he went to Harvard? And I'm like, no, I'd probably like want to see that diploma on the wall there. Like exactly. Now you don't have to hire him because he went to Harvard, but you'd want to know that he went to Harvard. But like, if he's been doing law for 20 years, you probably want to see some case success, a track record of success to back up that diploma from Harvard. So that's where my mindset shifted. And I was like, all right, all right. I'm not going to hide the fact that I was a SEAL. Um, but at the same token, I don't promote it in a way that like you should hire me because I was a SEAL. Because the truth is, is that the thing that SEALs have in common with each other is that we're stubborn stubborn dudes that just don't quit and the similarities beyond that are just like we're we're hard dudes that made it through a very very tough program that are very stubborn that won't quit but there's a lot of seals that would not be good for for people to hire you still have to hire them based <laughs> on what they're good for the job being a seal doesn't just give you this magical thing that just makes you good at everything there's a lot of jobs that i would suck at so I think that it's it's a bullet point, but it's not the bullet point. Yeah, yeah, it, that's interesting because, and the reason I ask is because um, I'm going through this thing at the moment where I'm I'm like, because I, I post a lot of photo, a lot of military photos, but I'm not like, like I'm not trying to fluff my career up and tell you how awesome I was, but I'm sort of like, these are some of the things I learned. Also, here's yeah. a kind of cool picture. Um, and I'm I'm still processing that. It's four years. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, five years, almost five years that I've been out, and I'm still processing. And I'm like, do I do I keep telling people about the military stuff, or is it does it run its course? Like I I, I just don't know where I sit with it at the moment. So it's interesting to hear you say it that way because I kind of come to the same realization. I'm like, well, I've got it. Like my formal education in dog training or in dogs was in the military, was special operations military work and dog program. Yeah. Yep. Um. 
and outside that, I've done a bunch of stuff as well, but I'm sort of like, sometimes I feel like I'm clingy to it when maybe I shouldn't. So anyway, I've, I've got some more processing to do, So, but it's always interesting to hear other perspectives on that type of stuff. No, absolutely. I think that a lot of people, especially in special operations, because every branch, the one thing I notice is like, you know, everyone's supposed to be the silent professional and like you do your job and like you don't need to, <laughs> exactly. And you don't need to, bo- and you don't need to boast about it. But at the same token is like, you're not boasting about it by letting people know that you have prior work experience doing some very kinetic things in some very austere conditions with very severe consequences of failure. So like that is the type of person you, you might want to hire, you know, if they knew that about you. Now, I do think that there the thing that's ruined it is not guys that are doing what you're doing, but it's it's that there's a lot of people that are just capitalizing off of what they did in a super commercial way. And and I'm not here to tell them that's that's even wrong because you know, people write books about Navy SEAL stuff and they make a lot of money doing it. Um but what it does do is it it changes the landscape for what the f- the next generations of seals are going through. So like I'll give you for instance, like right now you're not going to see any more Navy SEAL books with tridents on it because the Navy like the, the <laughs> basically the Navy Special Operations have, have basically put a, an X on that that you can't publish books with tridents on it anymore. But you know you have all these seals that previously have done that, so they're still out there, but the next generation can't do it. Um, but I think that the guys that are going to hate on you, uh, they don't quite get it yet because they're in a they're still in the community. And, and if I try to transport myself back in time to when I was in the community, I can kind of get it and I kind of get the mindset they have. And so if they want to hate, it's like, hey, man, don't worry. You can hate all you want. But like it's probably going to change for you in a couple of years when you get out. You know, you know, it's OK. Uh, but honestly, like if you're in, you probably shouldn't even have time to really have this hate because like not for nothing, you're training for war, bro. Just like go do your thing. Keep training, yeah, train yeah, hard, no. you know, I train hard. Your phone, like, oh, look at John, what's he doing? You're like, do some work, bro. Go do something. <laughs> no, it, it's, it's exactly it. So, you know, uh, I'll use an example like David Goggins though, you know, cause he's a very, very public figure that <laughs> uh, everyone knows, but you know, he did say something that was like, I've never had a hater doing better than me. And, you know, sometimes people that are hating could be struggling and maybe there's even a guy that got out of the SEAL teams that is struggling, but he's looking at me being public and they might think that it's a negative thing. But, you know, if you have all this time to like scroll through social media and obsess that somebody's doing something you don't agree with, you probably have too much time in your hands or you, or you don't feel like maybe you don't feel like what you're doing is enough. Um, so I, I true, truly same thing. I've never had a hater doing better than me. Um, so I just keep staying true to what I'm doing in my mission. And if anyone has a problem with it, I would absolutely any seal, if any seal ever reached out to me and like wanted to talk to me what I was doing, I would talk to him. I'd talk to him bro to bro hundred percent. Um, but the guys that are in that don't think that it's appropriate to post a deployment photo, um, of your past seal career when you're out. Um, I mean, that ship's already sailed, you know, that ship's already sailed, but, uh, but there is a community, within the SEAL teams right now that look look down on social media 100%. And uh, it, it does come from like the top and, and down because the bigger problem was active duty SEALs posting on social media. That was a real problem that they had to like, really? you know, it was, I mean, it wasn't like, it was a big problem for the SEAL team, but like it was very, very, very small in comparison to what's going on in the rest of the military. Now you have like chicks that are in the Marines just like on OnlyFans and stuff. And apparently that's okay. So... <laughs> But like, well, which ones? Just so I know which ones to avoid. Yeah, I know. Just for research purposes, I need to have a. Uh, it's just so I know uh, what not to look for. Yeah. Yes. No. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, but I, I've had personal friends of mine in the SEAL teams get in trouble for like their Instagram account, for instance. They had an Instagram account had nothing to do with. There was not a single SEAL thing on it whatsoever. I'm not going to mention him by name because he's still active duty right now. But he was doing he's doing photography and doing just doing pictures and sometimes he would like take a photo and he'd put like a caption with it and like the guy has like you know a unique sense of humor um and he said something in his caption that was like kind of mildly funny but he literally got brought into an office with like a bunch of like other seals that were like head you know higher higher up guys master chiefs and things and they grilled him over his instagram account and his captions 
and like not for nothing, like he didn't have a single thing. You could not articulate in this Instagram account that it even hinted at him even being in the military. There was nothing. It was just him being a photographer, being creative. And, um, and he got hemmed up for that. He didn't get any kind of like official trouble, but he faced some backfire and backlash for that. And that, um, and that was not even letting anyone know he was a seal. And so there is a level of, of that within the seal community. So every seal that is in the limelight, there are going to be other seals that don't agree with it. There are going to be some that are completely fine with it, but it's it's going to be a mixed reaction. And, um, and that's just, that's just the nature of the landscape. And I think that, um, any, anybody who doesn't understand it while they're in, I respect it and I understand it. But once they get out, everyone that I've talked to, the mindset changes once you get out. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. mate. Yeah. And what you said about, um, you know, haters never doing better than you. I, I'm kind of, I have a similar mindset. I'm like, I, I think it, the criticism mostly comes from a place of insecurity and I'm just trying to do my best at the moment to make sure that that stays that way. Mm-hmm. That I don't give them a reason to legitimately criticize what I'm doing in, in a business sense anyway. So yeah. Yeah. absolutely. Like, I mean, you told me today I was the first seal that you had on your, your podcast. And so I do have this sense of like, whenever I do anything and people know I was a seal, I do still feel like I do represent the seal team, even though I don't mean to, like, I don't, I'm not going out there to try to represent the seal team, but I know that if I treat someone poorly, if I do something wrong, that does represent the seal team. So I know that every day that I do anything, the way I engage with clients, the way I treat people, uh, does have some bearing. Somebody might meet me and maybe I'm the only Navy SEAL they ever meet in their entire life. So their entire perception of what a SEAL is may be through me. So I'm going to treat them with respect and I'm going to treat them how I want to be treated. And that's where it starts. It's just simply that. It's just treat everyone with respect and not carry around a huge ego just because I was a SEAL doesn't mean I'm good at everything. No, no, no. It's the opposite. When I was a SEAL, I was not the best at anything. That's why we had experts come in and train us that knew that knew more than we did. You know, that's why we have other trainers that are at the dog teams that know more about dogs than I do that teach me about how to handle a dog. That's why we have uh, race car drivers teaching us how to drive cars. That's why we have uh, world record holding skydivers teaching us how to free fall. And, you know, that's why we have... Uh, people who lived in the Philippines their entire life teaching us how to speak Tagalog, you know, so we, you have to come from a place of no ego and just, and just know that everybody out there, they know something you don't, and they're better at something than you are. And you can always learn. Yeah. And for what it's worth, mate, I think you've actually been a really good representative for the seals, mate, because, um, uh, you know, I've had my opinions of the SEALs working with them on, on deployments and whatnot and in, in, the, in the media space. But I think you've um, – I think today you've, you've done a good job, man, to sort of like be a little bit different from the mould, if that makes sense. Um, and it's clear from your, from your socials, mate, there's not a whole lot of whole lot of chest beating stuff on there, if, if any. Um, so, mate, last last question. Um, what's going on in the, in the future, bro? What, what are the plans for you, man? Like you have some like big goals or are you just happy doing what you're doing? So right now, currently, present day here, you know, I'm the owner of Divine Canines. So I have a dog training operation here in Los Angeles. So uh, operating in California that presents its own challenges. So you know, we are tr- we are trying to be a good beacon of of doing business in the dog training space, meaning that dog training is a huge industry that is completely there's no golden standard meaning that people are training dogs all sorts of different ways. Uh, people are doing things all sorts of different ways, which I think is a good thing. Uh, but I'm trying to be a, a good example of that and be able to expand and maintain a business in California, which maintains a consistent struggle every day with dealing with California. Even though I love California, it's like it's like having like a stripper ex-girlfriend. It's like a love-hate relationship. You know, it's it's, <laughs> it's, be- it's beautiful, but it, it yeah. screws you over every day. Uh, and then rescue 22 is like really my passion really, because, um, like I said, nothing fulfills me more than being able to help veterans and, and save veterans. So rescue 22, we're trying to, um, we're expanding our presence, getting more funding, getting more corporate sponsorships. Uh, we ended up just receiving, uh, the biggest grant we've ever received, uh, just recently, which was huge in our mission. So we're actually able to, we're contracting out new trainers throughout the country. So we're able to get more trainers on board that equals more dogs in the hands of more veterans because we have an infinite list of veterans that need this, that need this every, every day we get more and more. 
Uh, and, uh, and from that, you know, then I have like personal goals of like, Hey, some of my goals might sound crazy, but some of my goals are to like take days off and go do something because I get wrapped up in this mission every day that I forget to take days off. So I've, I've scheduled a few trips on the board. I've got Patagonia backpacking trip on the books. I've got a you know backpacking Ooh. trip for Yosemite on the books. Um, so I, I love being able to go on a backpacking trip, especially when I can take my dog and do some exploring. Um, you know, I've, I've even like, uh, just recently I've been posting these daily vlogs, which I've just been started to put up these last couple of days. Uh, oh, I saw that. It. Yeah. 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 And, and for me, it's really, I don't care about how many view it, if it helps anybody great, but it's a personal thing for me. And then I'm trying to get better at editing videos and like understand what I'm doing, um, and understand filmmaking. So this whole vlog thing has been a great way of, of letting go of perfection and just getting the process. So I think that like that, that has been my biggest, uh, boundary to getting content out to people is that I always feel like it's not good enough. And I always feel like it's not perfect. And then this vlog is like, well, ready or not, it's coming today, whether it's good or not, here you go. And I just need to make small adjustments and small improvements. And if I get 1% better at making a video every day, well, by the end of the year, I'm going to be a lot better. Yeah. I love that mentality, man. I love that. And like, I, I think in my opinion, business will teach you more. So we'll teach that to you more than, than the military does because you are 100% accountable Win, lose, draw. It's all about did you make dollars? Did you not make dollars? So, absolutely. I like that. Uh, hey, John, we'll, we'll knock it on the head there, man. But, um, dude, okay. thanks so much, man, for, for coming on, bro. I know I've been sort of like telling you I was going to get you on for ages and then I've just been reminded recently. So, no, um, no worries. No worries. Yeah, appreciate my dude. Thank you so much for having me on. It's a pleasure. And if uh, if any of you guys want to learn more about what we're doing with the mission of Rescue 22, feel free to go to www.rescue22foundation.org. You can find me there. You can find me at Divine Canines on Instagram, Facebook, all the socials. And if you really want to get personal with me, you can you can go follow my daily vlog that I just started. I think I have five subscribers, and I think um, four of them are family members. So feel free. <laughs> <laughs> yeah perfect bro and man, I'll, I'll tag you in all the videos and, and the promos and whatnot so um yeah thanks john appreciate it, my man cool cool it's been a pleasure see you bro we hope you enjoyed that episode of the origin canine podcast tune in next week for another episode in the meantime go to origincanine.com check out a safe innovative and built for purpose canine equipment